Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey, Aaron Peter, and Matt Brutzon. Hello folks, welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, it's a show about weirdos, doggone it. My name is John Boy, and it is John Boy Time, your host, John Francis Fahey. Joining me as ever, prettiest boy under the sun. Uh, he has three children in a trench coat, disguising themselves as an adult man. Each child ripped, shredded, huge cock. Um, Aaron Joseph Peter, how are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm good, John. Uh, you know, it is John Boy Time. It is. Uh, but one thing Somewhere. I think you've, ne- you've neglected to mention <laughs> is that John Boy Time kills. It does. It does. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> bro science has failed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Peter is life. That's right. Yeah. And uh, John Boy Time kills. Um, you know, we're all out here, in here, surviving. In, here. in the Matrix. Uh, inside the Matrix. And uh, my personal Morpheus is right here in the middle of my screen. <laughs> Dr. Matthew Brousseau, LSD. Yes. How are you, Matt? Matt, how are you? I'm doing well. It's uh, things are fine. No complaints. Is it a hard knock life? No, nah, not for me right now. Cool, man. Yeah, no. It's, it's for us. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Well, it's not hard, hard times. <sighs> oh god. How are you guys doing? Good. You I got... just just had like a bunch of edibles and stuff. You last just few days. had you just had them. No, 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 not before. Okay, because we already I, I, had our talk about your accidental overdoses. <laughs> no, no, luckily. Oh, boy. Ooh, ooh, I got myself in a mix up now. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I just did that the last couple of days. I was just like, I, I don't know. I just want to, um, just want to stay in bed and 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 watch stuff. But I'm always so, you know, get up and do something and like distractible. And then I was like. I'm just gonna, That's a you know. good trait to have. Like <laughs> yeah, the yeah, not yeah. the the not stay in bed and watch stuff trait is one of your better traits. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then, but then I don't ever. But then I don't ever watch anything. So I was just like slow rolling, like you know, some gummies, and mm. uh, you know, when you're a little like stoned, you kind of take it in more. You think about it more, and mm-hmm. you're you're a little more likely to to stay put and watch. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so I did that, but now I'm kind of like, all right, what the fuck now? You know, I'm like, yeah, let's uh, let's get let's get it going. Let's get outside. Let's go back to the studio. <laughs> out um, of the woods. Now they're talking. They're talking about uh, when we're gonna be out. Like when we're gonna end this? Maybe after the fifteenth or something. They're saying. Uh, well, the they're talking about reopening California, because California, Oregon, and Washington have kind of like a Western states pact. And they've yeah. outlined like six points of things that need to happen before we can kind of slow roll back into somewhat normalcy. And mm-hmm. one of those things is having a plan for surges, which is having a plan to go back into safer at home. Ah. Uh, because there will undoubtedly be more surges um, or outbreaks or whatever you want to call them. Um, and a few other things that they have to have in place. Um like social distancing guidelines for restaurants and public. Yeah, and yeah, like they're that. talking so, about that. Less tables. I mean, they're doing and... a really. I mean, I'm not a huge fan. I mean, I do like Gavin Newsom because he's really good looking, uh, and, and plays that's all the moves. role. Yeah. Uh, but and I, I'm not a super huge fan of of Garcetti, but yeah, they are same. both doing a really good job. Yeah. Yeah. Things, it they're, yeah. They're heading it very professionally, and they are setting. I don't even like Cuomo, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he's doing a pretty. Good job as well. Uh, he's not his brother, Chris, Chris Cuomo. Oh, boy, what a smoking hot guy that is. Uh, Inter- interesting, <laughs> interesting to note, though, uh, in, you know, um, the most unlikely, uh, unprecedented, everybody's talking about the lack of precedent, um, uh, how there's these couple of politicians that have really surged in fame over their effectiveness that maybe wouldn't normally be so charismatic or, I mean, Cuomo being the obvious one. Right, you know, well, he, he he's has having a little bit of a, of a Giuliani moment, I would say. He is having a Giuliani yeah, sure. moment. Sure. Um, although Giuliani really did nothing <laughs> yes. to earn that moment. Right. It yeah. just it, it just happened that he was the mayor of that city at the time. 
Uh, uh, the Giuliani moment was being a fascist and turning Times Square in, from a drug hovel into Disneyland. Um, that was his moment, for better or worse. Right. Um, also not his responsibility, really. More of a societal evolution, let's be real. But he enacted some things to make it easier for businesses to get in there. Yeah, you got the m M&M store. <laughs> the M&M store is, it's always the M&M store that people point yep, to because yeah, yeah. they have like a, just a big yellow M&M it's just, spinning it's around just, on 42nd Street. Yeah. And it's the really M&M, funny. And the yellow M&M is the slow one. It's the slow one. the one that talks like this. <laughs> That's right. You I know. think one of those M&Ms is, one of those M&M voices is a famous person. Oh, like John Lovitz? <laughs> the green, the, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, what, green the one's green the girl. slow one, yeah. <laughs> Billy West is one of them, I believe. He's, he did. I uh, think it was Billy West is the red one. Yeah. Mm. He did Fry for Futurama and all kinds of... Oh, interesting. I think it is Billy he was West. on Howard Stern a bunch. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's a, a great player. voice actor. Yeah, he's Fry, like you said. Oh, and guess who the yellow one is? Tell me. J.K. Simmons. No. <laughs> it's it's J.K. Simmons. Aaron, shut up. I just looked it up right now, dude. You're serious? I'm 100. I'm looking at it. He's looking at a picture of J.K. Simmons, painted mm-hmm. yellow. Yellow Eminem, voiced by J.K. Simmons. That's so dumb, dude. <laughs> Vanessa <laughs> Williams so, was the brown so one. That was so disappointing. <laughs> like who did, did you? Who did you think it yeah, could be? Oh, 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 not J.K. Simmons, <laughs> well, the Oscar well, contender, is the yellow yeah. fucking the, slow well, at, at M&M, the and I'm the J. weird Jonah one? Jameson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. J.J. Simmons. Yeah. So, you know, anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm imp- uh, impressed is not the right word. I'm satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprisingly satisfied with the job that... Uh, our West Coast politicians have done uh, yeah. addressing the crisis over here. What do you yeah. think about the ideas that the uh, the we got uh, you know herd immunity early because of all of our interactions with China? Who said that? That's just like a theory floating around that basically you know that we kind of like had more exposure because we're kind of like the gateway to those countries more than the rest of the country, and that we had more flights to Wuhan and stuff like that. Um. um no, because our, the death rates would be I mean, the death rate is pretty uniform over this country. So, um, I don't. I think we would have more deaths mm. if, yeah, if, well, if, her, if if herd immunity was being um, approached. We would have seen more deaths, like in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't. I don't buy that. Really, and I'm not a scientist, but yeah, I, I don't yeah, buy. I don't know much about medicine, you know. It know seems like there would have been there's a there would have been a measurable increase in pneumonia mm-hmm. cases mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah before they classified them as covid right yeah right but i mean maybe, maybe it's because all. all the chemtrails we have in the air maybe it's because know? we're just like breathing fresh air eating avocados and doing yoga yeah. and chill time that we're just like oh man beach, yeah uh, this virus it might, it might be because we're uh <laughs> less of a friendly community <laughs> than all we the don't have public transportation <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 i mean that's, finally that's it pays off right yeah yeah. We're spread out, not up. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Firestone. <laughs> <laughs> that red trolley would have been the death of us. Oh, man, that is a deep L.A. cut, John. Thank you You for like that. that? You like that Firestone <laughs> shit? I hope Greg Gonzalez is listening. You'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Gonzalez of the L.A. Meekly Podcast. I recommend everybody listen to it. Yes, I, yes. Him and Zany Daniel. Those uh, <laughs> are great guys. Mm-hmm. I love those boys. Uh, the two Gregs. I think they're like Back both home. married now or something. Yeah, out of yeah, nowhere. We're both engaged. Yeah, you this know they're cool. they're they're having like a normal life. John, what we do is is abnormal. <laughs> what we do is secret. <laughs> we, um, what we do is in the shadows. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, in the closet <laughs> and out of it. Uh, uh yeah, <laughs> I want to say uh, send a shout out to our friend Dallas who sent us that portrait of the three of us with the. That's God, like, what the Dallas. hell? How good? I mean, Dallas. Yeah. Boy, boy, brand you really new listener. Fucking, dived in really hard. You really <laughs> knocked it out of the park with that one. Yeah. And also, you really uh, nailed Matt's hair. Yeah. What well, John's yeah. hair? Look at John's mess. Oh, John's hair is yeah. perfect as well. Yeah. Mine is better than real life. Yeah. You look like a total psycho. <laughs> oh, well, I look like Roger from Doug. 
<laughs> the bully villain guy. He nailed the patchy facial hair, though. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, a, all in all, great job. It's all a justified and flattering yet unflattering portrait yeah. of all of us. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. With the great mm-hmm. Chris Burden poem, of course. Oh, God. Um, so thank you, Dallas. We'll post that on Instagram. if we And uh, shout out to our friend Josh from Oshkosh. Um, Oshkosh Josh? Oshkosh Josh, yeah. He's, oh, my he's gosh. English. Um, he got in touch, uh, but I, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to hold this up too much, Matt, because you have a, you have a little bit of a, a famous, yeah. famous guy. Yeah, you've got a doozy for us here, huh? Yeah. Um, so this is going to be about, uh, you've all heard of him. The fuck do you, does everybody know about him though? He's, uh, Mr. Uh, Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka. Off, author of the Metamorphosis. Yes. Yes. Most famously, right? Now well, I'm going to tell you. Uh, right up front, completely ignorant about uh, Kafka. Uh, Do you know anything about his work at all? Uh, no, I mean, I know what the metamorphosis is and, you know, what it had an influence on. Um, real quick, uh, we have, I think, 679 subscribers on YouTube right now? Yes, something like that. Yeah, it's pretty mm-hmm. pretty hot stuff. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, we, you know, we got a bunch of shit up there. All of these videotapes of these episodes are up there. You can watch us. PP podcast on Twitter, profiles and eccentricity on Instagram, and join the Patreon five bucks a month, extra episode a week. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's worth it. You know, yeah. you know. It... <clears throat> now tell me, uh, Kafka was a German fella. Uh, well, he was he was born in Prague. Uh, so oh. I I, I want to say uh, before we get into this, uh, his life itself. We're gonna talk a little bit. We're gonna talk about his life. We'll go through his whole life. Mention his works. And then after that, we'll kind of go, I'll give you a deeper dive other than the basic outline of the story, kind of mm-hmm. themes and maybe some of the ideas behind it. Okay. But first, I want to give you his life. Give, give me his life. Please so Franz Kafka, he, he has, in, in the minds of people today, you know, Kafka-esque is a phrase. And usually it's something that is bewildering or frightening to people. Um, but for me, I always found him um, funny. And yeah. a lot of absurdity. Yeah. And I and always, when I, when I heard that phrase, I always got, took it as almost Cronenberg esque. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's the, the, the modern the shocking equivalent. nature of it was almost hilarious. Absurd. Yeah. yeah absurd. It, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, the illogic that is built in that everyone treats as logic. Right. Um, so he was born in 1883 oh. in uh, Prague, Bohemia, Habsburg empire. So those are the, he was born in the city of Prague, in Bohemia, which at the time was Bohemia, was which is at the time the Habsburg Empire. Right. And he was born uh, a Czech German speaker mm-hmm. who was also Jewish. Ah, oh boy. So his nationality, in, in essence, was Czech, but he was uh, spe- a, a, a mainly German speaker, because mm-hmm. the the version, the Yiddish that they were speaking. Uh, uh, that also uh, had had a connection to German, so it was a, very, a natural in, and but he was also Jewish, and these are um, th- three three parts of himself that uh, he never uh, necessarily came to terms with. But we'll we'll get into that. We'll touch on that. Th- those identity points. You mean? Yeah, he, his, mm. his his identity um, was something that did, constantly was flirting around him, transforming into something else. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so he was born in, 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 in Josephoff, or, uh, Joseph, uh, Josephoff, yeah, J-O-S-E-F-O-F. It's, it was one of the oldest ghettos in Europe, old, seven, seven centuries of Jewish visionaries lived Whoa. and died there. Um, uh, he, he called it my prison cell, my fortress. Oh, boy. He had many conflicting uh, feelings about so much in his life. Uh, he was born uh, uh, the... The eldest child of Herman and Julia Kafka. Uh, he, they would later have three girls who lived and two boys who died in infancy. Uh, his father was a huge man, especially for that time. He was 6'2", big shoulders, powerful, loud, self-made. He would sit at the dinner table and he would chew the bones of the food. Ugh. And he would yell at anybody else who did it. <laughs> I chew the bones of this table. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are you, some kind of savage? You trying to ah. cut me in my own dinner table? Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> So 
So Her- Herman, uh, 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 Franz's father, he was born in extreme poverty in this uh, bohemian village called Osek, and his father was a ritual butcher, so he'd kill the animals for rituals. Uh, and by age seven, Herman was, uh, was pushing a peddler's cart. I don't know if he was apprenticing or assisting, but he was working. He hmm. was not, not schooled. And uh, he later married into uh, he later married Julie, and he got a small amount of money, and that was enough to start his own uh, shop as a salesman. Um, and he was kind of a bastard as an owner. There's a story about him having to go to after one afternoon, having to then go to each employee's house of residence and ask them not to quit because they had all quit on mass because <laughs> he was such an asshole. Uh, uh, Herman. Herman. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to his children, he was sarcastic and harsh. <laughs> uh, my, my two main sources for this are uh, the R. Crumb, David Zane uh, Merowitz book, Kafka. And it has R. Crumb's fantastic... Uh, oh, that's uh, excellent. No disgusting, shit. Disgusting, weird That's a drawings. perfect artist it, to it, do it, a it Kafka absolutely book. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he that's can, he can I, go very serious where necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's only one set of tits in this. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> Any but they're exquisite. Big ass <laughs> ladies with huge poop pubes I mean, coming out of their that bottoms. was more that was more of a uh, our crumb personal choice. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can always inject a little bit of your own <laughs> yeah, your DNA. sensibilities. Uh, and uh, um, so, so that's uh, that was that's kind of my source for um, a um, the, the the historical um, just the the dates and and life. Um, but then the the. Uh, part of that, part of it is also this uh, book, uh, Richie Robertson's Kafka, a very short introduction, where he kind of goes more into the theory, but there's also a touch of life there too, to explain some of the theories. So uh, one of them says that uh, uh, he Herman sells fancy goods. The other one calls him a fashion retailer. Uh, mm-hmm. But Herman, uh, in, in this uh, in Prague, he he declares that his family is Czech, um, and and even though they they live in this ghetto, the store is not necessarily in it. So they they kind of live this double life. And later there would be anti-Jewish riots, and and mm. his shop would be spared, ah. because he did not claim he claimed to be Czech. Yes. Right. Uh, however, he does go to synagogue a couple times a year, <laughs> instead of the weekly or daily, and uh, uh, he 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 would bring Franz with him. Uh, Franz uh, later describes this as uh, quote uh, preliminary sketches made in hell for later life in an office. Ah, wow. <laughs> he describes oh, his boy. <laughs> But, but yeah, but, fr- and that and that translation holds up, right? Like, well, yeah, that, well, there, yeah. There are there's a lot about the translation from his German into English. There are many things, and we'll touch on that later. And uh, that clearly bit. holds up. <laughs> that probably is yeah. a pretty yeah. basic Across, translation. You know, the yeah. translinguistics of uh-huh. it works out mm-hmm. yeah. because yeah. it sound it. The rhythm is beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's a very uh, it's a very uh, office space level. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. But uh, even as a kid, uh, Franz enjoyed the the, the kind the Hasidism and, and the idea that life on Earth and the intricacies among it are mystical and God is approachable and not some far away being. Uh, hmm. He did he did find something in that. Uh, he he later says he was a pampered and difficult child, often in trouble with authority, whether it his it was his father or uh, his par- Both of his parents worked. His mother did the books at his dad's shop, and uh, so he, they had a a governor or a servant take them to school, and he said the servant would often threaten him on his way to school and say he, that the servant would tell the teacher if he ever did anything bad. Hmm. Oh, boy. Uh, he, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're fucking, it's, a, it's a child. If you're going to tell on the teacher, you're an adult. <laughs> uh, when, I te- when I tell his parents. But he said his mother, he always felt his mother didn't really understand him, and it, whether that was because of his father's, you know, <laughs> the way he dominated the household... Right. Uh, there's a story where she uh, he he writes to one of his uh his, I wonder his girlfriends. if she I wonder if she couldn't understand him because he was Franz Kafka. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he didn't understand himself at times. So yeah. yeah, there's definitely that. She doesn't get it. <laughs> but, he, You're he, so Kafka esque, Franz. <laughs> What is Down, it about you? You get downright Cronenbergian. <laughs> I'm sorry. Continue, Matt. No, no, you say he he writes about this one one time where um, uh, uh, later you know he he lived until his parents' house until he was about 31, and which is not abnormal uh, for that time, I believe. And um, if you like that sort of thing, if you're into it, 
And she, uh, his his mom uh, kisses mom, him. Mom, good- sis. <laughs> <laughs> his mom kisses him goodnight, and and he's like, "Oh, that was nice." And she's like, "Oh, I would I never did this before because I always thought you didn't like it, but now that I know." And so he's like, you know, you know it was like took ten years for for that level Wait. of intimacy to emerge. And- <laughs> Wait, are right. you being weird porno about it now, or no, is that real? No, 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 no. Like, you know, if you... Oh, you don't mind if I give you a kiss goodnight? I always thought that freaked you out. Well, now he's oh, never going to fucking leave home. Yeah. <laughs> the kissing starts now? <laughs> Shit, I'm going to be here until I'm 48. <laughs> not, not when he's 30. I think he's in his teens when this happens. <laughs> oh, okay. First okay. time to kiss him. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, God, but, but, Mom. But I, and I think largely because of his father, he, he, he would later write that he believed that paternal love was a form of selfishness. Paternal love was a form of selfishness. And, and it, it <laughs> alternates between tyranny and slavery, even if it's well-meaning. Because, you know, oh. the, to him, something like, you have to listen to me, I am your mother. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, well, that's tyranny. And, right. and the phrase, you have to do this, you're my son, that's slavery. To him. Right. Right. Uh, hmm. And also, yeah, I think I, I buy some of that. You know, there is, um, there was, so this is out of nowhere, but it, I think it applies. Uh, Bill Burr, comedian extraordinary, had this great joke about the problem with having uh, kids and then getting a divorce or whatever was that, you know, this kid ends up being something that half looks like you and half looks like someone you want to slap the shit out of. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this kind of selfish, it's the, it's the brilliance of, of nature and evolution is that you can't help but love the thing that kind of is you and looks sure. like you and it helps, it m- makes you keep it around a little bit, but on the or, other hand, you do kind of make it rub your feet and take out the trash whenever you don't want to do it. <laughs> In, in, in some bad cases, you might hate it because it reminds you of you. Of course, of course, right. yes, very good. But not any of the three of us, of course. <laughs> no, no, no. I've... Love each other and ourselves deeply, and only and, ourselves, and more than anyone else. That's right. Yeah. Except but, the fans. Uh, yeah, except for the fans. <laughs> <laughs> so his father was always kind of a bastard. You know, he would, um, of course, he would hit him. Um, spank him. He once he would yell at him. He once said, "I, I will, I will uh, uh, gut you like a fish." I believe it was the phrase. Oh, his dad too. His, yeah, so his mm-hmm. dad was uh, quite authoritative, and um, and you know Kafka never grew up to be a big man like him. So there was always, you know, his dad expected him to be a tough, a tough man, and Kafka never uh, felt like he was ever that guy. Probably uh, needed but, to go in some kind of cocoon or something. Well, John, that's funny. Mentioned that in one of his later stories. Oh. Uh, cocoon. Well, the burrow. Oh, that, so he could turn into an old that. man in a swimming pool in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to turn into a big guy that beats his turn kids. Turn into Steve Gutenberg, <laughs> Wilford Brimley, Jack Lemon. Diabetes. So even though they're not practicing that much, at thirteen he does have a bar mitzvah. Uh, at, at his time, is his, his parents call it a confirmation. And, mm. uh, like as, a Catholic confirmation. Well, because as Robertson, Robertson ah. describes it as as a dominant Christianity, typical of assimilate assimilated Jews. It's kind of yeah, like Jews celebrating Christmas here, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. In right. The United States of America. Uh, <laughs> what what do you it's, 16... it's a it's just a Western holiday at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, when he's 16, he reads uh, Darwin's Origin of the Species, species uh, Haeckel's uh, uh, Riddle of the Universe. He reads a lot of Nietzsche when he's growing up. I, mean, I think it's very common. Nietzsche was huge then. Hmm. Um, at, at 16... Uh, and he probably yeah. read it in, the, in German. Yes, yes, he did. Which is the language... Yes. I know, what, what time frame would this be? So, uh, so he's 16, so it's 19, uh, 1899. Okay. And uh, that's a contemporary of Nietzsche at yes, the time, right? Yeah. Like he's he's red room. Yeah, he's he, he's well. he came out. You know, I think he, I think Riddle was out uh, ten years before or so. Uh, sixteen when he's sixteen, a, a Christian girl is found dead around Passover. That's where the Jews are all blamed for this. So a Jewish man is arrested, railroaded, he's sentenced to death, later commuted, but he's still in life for uh, prison for life. Anti-Semitic riots break out. Jesus. Um, uh, you know, and this was, you know, it, 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 in such a, a mixed culture, the the Jews were always the scapegoat. 
Of course. Uh, not like the, because they're not now. Uh, <laughs> but, but, well, no, but it, they're an easy target because they stick together mm-hmm. and they maintain their culture despite being assimilated into the culture at large, but they, they're still their own people. Yes. And it's an easy target. And their, their ghetto is called disgusting. And there's at one point they have the, it's surrounded by walls and, and, and Prague tears the wall down and, Shortly after, they the Jews themselves put up wire fence. Hmm. They put up wire fence around their own ghetto. Yes. Oh, that's a dirty trick. That's a dirty <laughs> trick by the Gentiles. No, by the Gentiles. By the non-Jews. Yeah. How, how do you mean? Well, uh, walls work. Walls work both ways. Right. Not only do they keep people out, but they also keep you in. And if you can trick somebody into putting up their own barbed wire. Yes. Right. Does yeah. that make sense? It does. It does. I think also part of it is that if you can it's go out tricking into... Tricking the cows into putting up electrified fence. Right. But part of that also is you're more willing to do it if you know that you kind of have the cunning to go out into Gentile culture and be assimilated and make your way in the world. And then you're like, well, the only place they can really find me is at home. So I'd rather keep them out of here because I know I can assimilate in their world. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah, sure. Suppose, yeah, you know. You but they are so all they are going back to a mandated ghetto. Right, right. I mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's seven hundred years Gaza old or so. I mean, but also, you know, they leave the ghetto and there are, you know, there are people on the street all over Prague, you know, with pamphlets, anti-Jewish pamphlets, or the, they'll they'll yeah. have one of those, uh, you know, picture boxes, and in it is a a, a caricature of a Jewish man murdering someone. Oh, this is just on the street. Like, Jesus. there's no way a Jewish person in Prague at this time could go around and not think there was an anti-Semitic streak all the fell through the city. Right. Because there was. Because there was. And it was open and in their faces. There, was, there were children would sing songs in the streets Oof. about it. Do you know the lyrics to some of those songs, Matt? <laughs> this is heart? one of them. This, uh, from, <laughs> this is from the uh, R. Crumb. Which I'm uh, sure you do. Merowitz book. This is children singing in the street. Uh, don't ever buy sugar from the Jews. Everybody's heard the news. A Christian girl killed by the Jews. Wait, it rhymes in English, too? I'm sure there's, you know, artistic license. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't buy the sugar from the Jews. Hmm. It might be Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Only your dealer knows. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get some of that Jew sugar? <laughs> Some of that <laughs> burger sugar. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I made myself laugh. I'm sorry, <laughs> listeners. Now, but, but so so you know, as this is going on though, Kafka himself is um, it's it's not like that he necessarily feels like he's in, he's just aware of it, and it, he he writes. He says, "What do I have in common with the Jews? I don't I don't even have anything in common with myself." <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah that's pretty good it's also maybe the most neurotic jewish thing you could ever say so <laughs> that's, I mean, yeah, that's it what... sounds like woody allen said <laughs> it. Uh, it sounds like larry david said <laughs> yes, it exactly <laughs> and, i mean that's what that's what they write that's what the... yeah, it's coming the jews i don't even come with myself <laughs> it's one of those ironic things where it's like that's how you know mm-hmm. <laughs> that's yes. how you know you're jewish <laughs> yes oh, you're it's, it's self, self-deprecation you, you, You'll know the infinity. Mo- the moment you're just self-deprecating like that, you right. have yeah. that in common. Like Groucho Marx, I don't yeah. want to be a member of a club, then it would have me exactly. as a member. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Which means you're part of a tribe, not a club. <laughs> <laughs> 5,000 years of rich history from Moses to Sandy Koufax. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> uh, 1901, he's 18, he enters university, he studies law. Um, and there he meets uh, Max Brod, who uh, would become a, a famous uh, author and journalist. And, and is they he become... a German? Uh, is he a Jewish fellow? What's his? Uh, uh, Brod, yes, I believe so. Yeah, Brod sounds like a Jewish fellow. Uh, and um, they would be they would be friends for the rest of uh, close, very close friends for the rest of Kafka's life. Uh, while while he's in college, he reads Plato in the original Greek. He reads Dostoevsky. He calls Dostoevsky Jeez. a true a blood a true blood brother. Uh, uh-huh. he, he reads the the French philosophers in French. Um, he would wear a, a red carnation in in his lapel in his buttonhole huh. because he was a he, he believed he was a socialist. Yeah. Ah. And um, 
he starts he 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 is an athletic uh a, a boy he he comes he comes of age in this time um when when the belief of the balance between the mind and body is shifting so so before this you have descartes and rationalism and 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 what it was is that the body had to be controlled and countered by the mind right so the victorians would wear clothes that that constricted the body that reformed the body through constriction uh, and forcing it out of its natural movement, right? You tilt the necks up. Right. Uh, the waist the... in. Yes, exactly. I'm still uh, listening. Keep talking. Then in 1884, Nietzsche writes that only a child says they are body and soul. An enlightened man instead says, I am body entirely. The soul is only a word for something in the body. Oh, God. That's, that's wonderfully just uh, depressing, isn't it? <laughs> No, but Nietzsche was a troubled man. You're but, nothing but, but, but brilliant. meat, dude. You're nothing but meat. That other shit is fake. <laughs> but there's beauty in the meat, is what he's getting at. Yes, hot I mean, meat. And, and, <laughs> Aaron, you're me. telling me. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's the idea of oh, a, bo a bodily progress through not restriction, but action. As opposed mm -hmm. to making your body better by, by forcing it, you, you let the body act naturally. And Do its so, thing. Nudism started becoming popular. Nudism was healthy. People started wearing looser clothes that let the body breathe. Um, nice. it, it led to this this Hammer thing. Goes and shit. It, it led to this thing called the <laughs> the Van der Vogel movement, which encouraged hiking and open air swimming and rowing. And Nietzsche would say, Nietzsche said, "You say I, and you are proud of this word. Your body and its great intelligence does not say I, but performs I." Ah, oh, that's mm. nice. I like that a lot. You like that? I as a performance. Mm -hmm. Yes. I and, sing the body electric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so Kafka and Broad, they, they would go hiking every weekend. Twice a day, Kafka would do calisthenics in front of yeah, an open window. Yeah, what, a Brokeback Mountain? Maybe. I mean, there was, there was much latent homosexuality in, in, in Kafka. Broad? Broad Broad back? Back Mountain? <laughs> no, I said Brokeback, but okay. Brokeback's even funnier. Good it job, is. John. You yeah. fucking homophobe. <laughs> I don't even understand. I just made a pun. Even... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real convenient. <laughs> you made the fucking stupid homophobic joke, you shit. -ass. I love Brokeback Mountain. And I do too. I love when Spider Man butt fucked the Joker. <laughs> yeah. It's not even Spider Man? Spider -Man? No, it's not Spider Man. It's Mysterio, I know. you fucking I know. Dumbass. I love when Spider Man. But fuck the Joker. Well, that's a crossover. I'd watch. What do you want? So what if? <sighs> All right, write it, write it, loser. <laughs> I am. I already did. I drew it. <laughs> <laughs> so Kafka, he would do calisthenics in front of an open window twice a day. Oh, nude? Uh, no, he was he, even when he went to the the um, uh, sanatoriums, the the workout places. He many people would get nude. He usually did not get nude. Open nude. window. Yeah, in front of an open world, because it's the fresh air. It's part of this being a part of the ah, yes. being a part of nature. The Van der Vogel, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, uh, he, he started following the teachings of uh, Horace Fletcher and masticating his food until it was liquid. One of, those, one of those programs that for the health of the body, you will yeah. chew the food so many X number of times. Yes. And, 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 Is there and anything about that that's scientifically accurate? Uh, you, you are supposed to chew your food pretty significantly, uh, more than... I, certainly more than I do. do. I mean, it, it, you have less heartburn if you chew your food more. Chew the fuck out of that shit. Nice. You got your mechanical digestion in the mouth, and then you got the chemical digestion in your stomach. Hot. Super hot, bro. Mm -hmm. He also, uh, uh, I don't know if it's around this time, but I think it's around this time, uh, Kafka also becomes a vegetarian. Mm. Huh, like he, finds, he, he, he finds meat uh, <laughs> kind of disgusting. <laughs> He find it, it make it makes him feel it makes him feel disgusting and maybe because it's a bloody process I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. The savagery I mean, well, of the flesh is something. <laughs> and his father was a ritual ritual. Uh, his grandfather sucker. was a ritual slaughterer. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's fucking yeah. interesting. I feel like Nietzsche ended ended up being a vegetarian as well, but that mm. might be wrong. Um, I mean, self torture is a hell of a drug. Yeah, it is. You get, you know anybody that's holding? <laughs> you got any of that self torture? In uh, 1906, he's uh, um, 23. He graduates uh, from university. He does the the normal. You do one year of unpaid work. 
and then the next year he gets a job um and he hates his he, he gets a job i believe he's working for an insurance company i didn't write down but but it's 12 hour days and he hates it because he he has started writing and if a 12 hour day he can't he doesn't have energy or time to write yeah mm -hmm. so after two weeks he, he resigns then he gets a job at this place called the works workers accident insurance institute for the kingdom of bohemia mm. oh god and he becomes a workplace injury investigator. Oh, boy. And no, Matt, I'm sorry to yes. derail So he was the guy in all. Fight Club. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. What is the, the, the nature of the word bohemian with the, with the place bohemia? Uh, and Aaron, chime in, too, please. Well, it's it's the part, Matt, uh, I'll, I'll defer to you. For anybody that uh, doesn't know, I just... But it's it's the area known as Czechoslovakia, or once known as Czechoslovakia, that then became Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, Which contained also, Prague and... Right. Okay. Uh, but Matt, you may have a more accurate map than... No, 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 I, uh, that's, that's, one thing. Does. that's one thing I honestly didn't look up. But but I think, and that is, you know, there's a city within a state within the empire. And you know, Bohemia in effect is the is a state within. And the word empire. Bohemian was that because they did they did have some, you know, non uh, bone came... chewing <laughs> kind of attitude. Well, well, well the, did they the, have, the, did they the have some laid back kind of non aggressive thing that looked well, that a well, lot of you know, that kind of like Prague. that yeah that gypsy kind of lifestyle that look that Bohemian uh, uh, aesthetic uh, had has roots there. Okay. In that area of the world, so Got Bohemia, uh, well, Bohemia was a um, a nation state at a time, or area, that's like saying Persia now. Yeah. Persia doesn't exist anymore; it's Iran, right. right? Yeah. But Bohemia eventually broke up once there was this kind of Balkanization of that whole area of the world. Actually, Balkanization comes from the Balkans. Yeah. The splitting up of that. Yeah. Um, empire. So that's my understanding. I know there's going to be smarter people who also have the luxury of looking it up online, but right now we're recording, so we're doing our 70%. Okay. I just I, I don't know that, and I wanted to see if anybody else did, uh, but uh, neither of you helped, so that was perfect. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Next time, don't ask so many questions and just listen. <laughs> yeah. But I, 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 you know, it, it, I believe it's something in the vein of L.A., Within California, within the United States, as far as the the lifestyle, well, well the li I mean the lifestyle, you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot. Of, Prague was a hot spot for oh, uh, much like Googling much like Vienna, much yep, like Vienna. Googled it. Prague was a hot spot for um, uh, a lot of uh, at the time modern thinkers and artists. Uh, yeah, artists. Kafka, Kafka met. I mean, Kafka and Brode were. Uh, uh, ran in these circles of artists and and writers that were um, right. It was like 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 what Vienna was for philosophy. I think yeah, maybe Prague essence, was yeah. kind of like for art. Yeah. Um, and that of course attracted a certain lifestyle of person. I guess. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm ready to I'm ready to move on. <laughs> good. Good question. Uh, so he starts working for this uh, Workers Accident Insurance Institute, and so his job there is to investigate workplace injuries. And deny and, claims. <laughs> no, no. He was, he was, uh, he, he took the workers, you know, being a socialist, I assume, you know, that had something to do with it. And uh, he was very proud of, of helping the workers and oh, solving man. their problems. Um, there is an, ep I think, I believe it's an apocryphal story, but, but one person says that they believe him to be uh, the designer of the first uh, uh, um, uh, hard hat. But he does, he, he does say. Really? Yeah, but it, I don't know if there's any evidence. Could be bullshit, but it's well, someone right. said it, and then someone this, else said there's no evidence for. This hard hat is Kafka-esque. It's a thing, yeah. <laughs> but, but fucking he, tentacles growing out of it and shit, but it works. Through, through through all of these investigations, he does design many laws that then do go on to save a lot of lives. Really? And because so he, Kafka... gradu he graduated with a law degree. He graduated with a law degree, yes. Yeah. So uh, OSHA brought to you by Kafka. Yeah, in essence, you know. Yeah. But he, That's so great. He, but he's constantly inundated with all of these workers whose fingers are are cut off from, especially in the lumber <laughs> sector. <laughs> Their fingers are cut off, and so he has he has these diagrams of all the different ways the fingers are cut off. Ah, uh, so that informs his literature down the road. Well, sure. He he, he writes about it. This is what he writes about. He said oh, he's talking he's he's talking about some of uh, all of his cases, and he writes. People fall drunkenly from scaffolding into machines. Beams collapse. Ladders come crashing down to the ground. 
Whatever is lifted up falls down. Whatever is spread on the ground, people trip over. And it gives one a headache to think of all those young girls in Chinaware factories who keep falling downstairs with huge piles of dishes in their arms. Oh, my God. <laughs> what a travesty. I love it. <laughs> oh, man. He's just he's just seeing a never ending Three Stooges episode. In his <laughs> yeah, head all the exactly. Time. Big stuff of the Stooges is that people are actually getting hurt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so most of Bohemia was basically Czechoslovakia. Aaron, we moved on, dude. <laughs> well, I I just yeah, want I know, I know there's just, gonna be somebody on fucking Patreon stop. who's gonna be like actually, and they're gonna push their fucking <laughs> spectacle Warby Parkers up their bridge nose. And they're going to say some bullshit. You got done saying you love them. No, not on Patreon. We love those people. <laughs> Did I say anything negative about them? <laughs> you said pushing a War- Warby. Warby. I wear Warby Parkers. Man, you don't even know who the fuck Warby Parker is. He's part of Bohemia. You know what? It's my favorite porn star. <laughs> I can't, by the way, can't believe Warby Parker is not a porn star already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, I get it. So, 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 so uh, Kafka's in his twenties now, and he spends a lot of the time. Um, you know, uh, when he's younger, he's encouraged by his dad to do it, but he does it now normally. He's, he visits brothel, brothels often. Um, he enjoys pornography, and um, why? What kind of pornography <laughs> did they have? I don't know. You know, Civil War playing cards. Oh, yeah, they got them from you. I <laughs> yeah. learned about watching you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Big Magazine back then was Chicks and Insects. <laughs> uh, I'm sick. I'm insects. <laughs> but spider. <laughs> I can't. What a... <laughs> insect. Oh, boy. Chicks with insects. Uh, Ma- Max Broad calls him uh, an assassin wo- womanizer. Um, Whoa. No, womanizer. He, he is. I mean, that's that's one of the things that gets lost in this idea of of Kafka is uh, he was a womanizer, but he also was he he was constantly back and forth. He he was a womanizer, but he also had this insane fear of of sexual failure. Yeah, so, I get it. So so he found <laughs> sex to be uh, 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 gross, but also he and I'll, there's a quote I'll get into it in a little bit. But he also found it amazing. That's you know, we call that. Toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, task, to, toxic Kafka. Kafka in it. I don't know. I didn't do that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> ni- 1908, he has his, his first uh, published works, and it's eight stories in a literary magazine, magazine called Hyperion. No word on how it went. It was just this is the first time anything was published. That's pretty dope. Uh, 1911, he's 28. He gets a job at his uh, brother in law's asbestos factory. Oh, nice. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's not a I'm big fan of it. I'm going to go back home and drink <laughs> some roach puree before I go to work at my brother-in-law's asbestos factory. <laughs> he's French Canadian. Well, I don't the, know what that was. The making tomorrow's cancer today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> Listen, if we could manufacture depression, we would. We can only come up with this asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's so perfect. The Kafka would work in an asbestos factory. Yes, I, w- I wonder what informed his ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! It's like that. Like there was something he corroding in his mind. He worked in an factory. <laughs> well, oh. so so um, ma- machinery in his stories often, and there's a, there's a philosophical. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, turn it against the machines, this. not the asbestos. But, <laughs> but but machines feature largely in his stories, and and yes. sometimes they're physical, and sometimes they're organizational. But they but the machines are the things that usually destroy the people in his stories, and and routine. And people uh-huh. doing routine to the point where the routine dehumanizes them. Yes, mindless mechanization. Yes. And yes. some of this is from Weber uh, or Weber. Uh, but some of this is also what we talked about in the Sam Patch episode, which is when, when, when you are removed from the product, when you are only doing a piece of it, the artistry and the understanding cube. of it. John, you love Cube. I was just going to say that's exactly the, the Cube thing. Yeah. They're like... Uh, 
well, I just designed the doors. Yes. I don't exactly. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be for. And there, there's a lot of characters in Kafka where I just do this thing. I don't know what this whole process is. I, I do yeah. this. Cube that's, is Kafkaesque. It's very, very, yeah. That's John's favorite movie. I mean, it's my favorite bad movie for sure. Yeah, well... It was so so uh, the asbestos factory. Uh, many of the workers are just are are uh, local girls, women, and and Kafka writes of them. He, he uh, they, they bother him, and not the people themselves, but but what has happened to him. And he writes, uh, the girls in their unbearably dirty and loosened clothes, with their hair as untidy as when they woke up, with the expression of on their faces frozen by the incessant noise of the transmissions and by the automatic but inexplicably halting machine, are not human beings. Nobody greets them. Nobody apologizes for bumping into them. If they are called to do some small task, they carry it out immediately and return to the machine. They are shown what to do by a jerk of the head. They stand there in their petticoats subject to the, 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 the pettiest power. They have not even enough calm, uh, good sense to acknowledge and conciliate, conciliate the power that by their looks and gestures. It, so and these consul- women have become that parts power. of the machine. Yes. Yes. Well, and why and only and the women? And they're treated as such <laughs> yes. because those are jobs women had. Yeah, I mean, they, they, it, it would be anybody else, but it, the women it was are a woman those job. Jobs. Wow, those women were taking our jobs. That's right, <laughs> and 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 because of the routine, they don't even have enough, as he says, good sense to acknowledge that they could have power. <laughs> they don't even have the the frontal lobe <laughs> to understand. All of the biomass has been appropriated to the breasts <laughs> and their assholes, so the. <laughs> The frontal lobes have not been developed in such a manner for them to develop God. independent thought. <laughs> Therefore, they are treated merely like asbestos widgets in a grand bureaucratic machine that serves only the greater purpose of the society at large. I fear, <laughs> I'm beginning to fear that the quality of the asbestos will not reach its true potential. <laughs> it will not reach purely masculine ideals of asbestos. Can I just tell you guys that you guys are really fucking up this asbestos? <laughs> With your female the you know, this asbestos machine is really hybrid about, shit? I would only pay about 70% of what this asbestos is worth. <laughs> It's like yeah. ass worstus. <laughs> yeah, ah, Deutsche Spear. Uh, asbestos. <laughs> oh, you knew where I was going. Both of you motherfuckers I, I knew didn't. where I was going. I didn't. Ah, I didn't. Asbestos. <laughs> if I had seen it before, I would have jumped all over for sure. But you didn't That's see very, it. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have the vision. You did not have the vision. <laughs> I was like, I was like an asbestic, asbestic factory. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's what they got to say upon inspection. Like, was this asbestos made by women by any <laughs> chance? <laughs> so in 1911, 1912, he's 28, he's 29. Uh, during this time, he goes to these, uh, He almost every day, he goes to this, these theater performances. It's like a traveling, traveling theater by these, uh, it's these Yiddish actors and he, he, he befriends them, and they, they start teaching him about Eastern Jewish culture. Uh, and so Eastern. He, he... Eastern Jewish culture. Uh, and I, I'm not exactly familiar on the, on details, but, but it also that he, you know, with his dad being uh, as not religious as he was, Kafka, he understood some of the earliest stories, but it's not like he was... He, he was it was a part of his life, you know? Uh, so from these actors... He, he learns of uh, old Hasidic Jewish, Jewish stories. Maybe this is even what he learns, if not earlier. There's an old story in the in his ghetto of, uh, of the Gollum, the what is basically a Jewish Frankenstein. Yeah. That uh, you know one 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 preacher or, or, or one um, um, rabbi, ra- rabbi uh, every, he would he would write uh, truth on his head, and the Gollum this this. This Frankenstein, he would go out. Man and pre- made out of clay, usually, right? Yeah, yeah. He would protect the he would protect the neighborhood, and then uh, every Friday, you know, he, he couldn't work, so the the preacher would take off the first two letters, and so it would spell death. Then, and then there's the story of one one Saturday or every Saturday they wouldn't work, and then it's one Saturday or was it Sunday? One Sunday. What am I doing? Saturday. Uh, Saturday. Uh, and so then one day he for one time he forgets to. To, to take off the first two letters, and so then the monster 
starts tearing apart the 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 neighborhood. And so this is just an old story. This kind of and it's something that you can this uh, it's big part of the like Hasidic it's, mythology. It's, and it's religious, like but it's also you know it's absurd in a way that you know many stories in the Bible. Maybe many what we consider Christian stories are not absurd in this, you know, this monster, this this man-made the monster. It's not a god-made monster, yeah. thing. It's this. Yeah, know. the man. Yeah, the golem is an archetypal story that that transcends just uh, Judaism for yeah, sure. It's, sure. It's but a very it is, human story. But wouldn't you? It's about creating something you can't control, right? Certainly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Certainly. So it's sure. pre Frankensteinian. <laughs> yeah. Well, Frankenstein sounds like a Jewish name to me, John. <laughs> yeah, right, it does. That's very true. Uh, and it's also Frankenstein's monster. It's invoked uh, in in the uh, the Sopranos. Inglorious, Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very very. It's a. I think it's a very archetypal human story. Uh, yeah. And also, and, but the, the the Jews have the advantage of being one of the oldest civilizations in the world, so it, it probably. Uh, originated with them, or perhaps uh, yeah. It, and in this neighborhood, there's a ch- there's a church that is is incredibly old, and and you know there are rumors that some of the original writings of this are in the mm. in the attic of the church. Yeah, uh, one, I'm sorry, real quick, but yeah, go. one of the things I I think is interesting about um, the Jewish side of faith is that um, you know there isn't like really the forgiveness. But there's also there's not the damnation either. Well, there's definitely the uh, what you've done is written though. You know what I mean? Like it's like it's like no, that sure. happened. That happened, and right. It's not as as if there's going to be yeah fire and brimstone. There's no over hell, it. right? But there is going to be, I think, maybe more of a uh, a reckoning. Yeah, a little bit more of a, a purgatorical kind of. Mm thing going on but well, also that's, that's all stuff you have i need to deal to with at the very least you have to deal with the the reckoning of your community yes yeah like but nothing is really washed away or anything like that like, it's kind of very serious where they're just kind of like no that's those that definitely happened so well and that's <laughs> karma too right like karma people say oh karma is a bitch because what goes around comes around that's not really how karma works karma is really just a tally of your deeds ah it's nothing. It it doesn't mean like oh you did a bad thing and now oh man a couple of years from now you're gonna get hit by a bus or you're gonna get no no no, it's just the record of the deeds yeah. that you do in all, in all lives. Ah, and um, I just think I think it's very interesting that uh, the Christian faith is the one that's like. Hey, well, if you say you're sorry, it's all good. Yeah, <laughs> right. it's very, very, very silly. I'm sorry, Matt, but I just wanted to give a little. I'm bit really more sorry. Of, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to give a little bit more of background to some of uh, the ideas as I know them, uh, uh, and, and as inaccurate as they may be, but that might be informing. Yeah, well, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, so uh, you know, learning um, from these these Yiddish actors and. Um, um, he, he he. Whether it's around this time, but but at, at times in his life, he does carry around a pocket uh, anthology from the Talmud, and you know there's a thing in it, uh, and maybe this is when he starts reading it. You know, there's you know, man without a wife is not a man, is is is, is something that is a, a teaching out of it, mm-hmm. and it is a, it also so 1912, right around this time, he meets uh, Max Brod's friend uh, Felice Bauer. And uh-huh. uh, she is his first, um, as far as we, as, as far as people know from correspondence, his first, you know, adult girlfriend of sorts. Mm-hmm. And this is what he writes from the night he met her. He writes, "I was not at all curious about who she was, but rather took her for granted at once. Bony, <laughs> empty face that wore its emptiness openly, bare throat, a blouse thrown on, looked very domestic in her dress, although." As it turned out, she was by no means, she by no means was. Uh, oh. And he oh. says, almost oh. broken nose, blonde, Ooh. somewhat straight, unattractive hair, strong chin. As oh. I was taking my seat, I looked at her closely for the first time. By the time I was seated, I already had an unshakable opinion. Damn. Oh, boy. Yeah. A lot going on. She had a bare neck and a, a homely 
homely essence. <laughs> her chin <laughs> could cut through diamond. <laughs> Her nose seemed broken by George Foreman himself. <laughs> her blonde hair. And her kiss. face grilled upon the grill of his namesake. <laughs> <laughs> by George, this woman was wrecked. I mean, she was a real mess. <laughs> and this I was. Bitch is no motherfucking <laughs> joke. <laughs> I can only tell you that I was having none of it. It was purely obscene. <laughs> An affront to the aesthetic values of nature. In four years from now, we would be married. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her. Her, <laughs> her visual appearance was something of an atrocity. <laughs> and I was absolutely scandalized. I would never love a woman as much as I loved her. <laughs> what a piece of shit. We all are. Felice Bauer. So uh uh the now this is from what I got one of these from each source. Now the night after meeting her, he writes his first well known story, uh, which is called The Judgment. But also uh, the another source says the The Judgment it's, is written the, it's in a night, is it not? Yes, yes. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, the judgment is uh, another source says it's written after he doesn't attend synagogue for Yom Kippur. And oh. so maybe it was the same night. Maybe it was two nights there. But he writes the judgment, his first uh, well-known story, and he writes it all in one night from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Jesus. And he writes to Max Bro and he says that finishing the story felt like an ejaculation. <laughs> was he on speed? Um, Poppers? It, 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 I don't think so. In in okay. in e neither of his bios that I read is anything mentioned. Uh, Benadryl, but maybe Benadryl. it was just so commonplace that it wasn't. But I don't think so. No, but I mean, also being manic is like being on speed. Yes. So, just and, and, and uh, you know, for him, um, the the best time for him to write would have been night because he he was in his parents' house. It was loud. Night time. His door. Right time. His, his room was a room <laughs> between rooms. The people would walk through it. To get to another one, it was it was incessant, and so yeah, that his, da that. his dad would be stomping around looking yeah, for bones yeah, to suck. Absolutely, it was insectant. <laughs> no, so is insectant. The the judgment. Uh, he writes it from ten a.m. to six or ten p.m. to six a.m. and he writes that it felt like an ejaculation. And, and as Robertson knows, at the end of his story, he uses the word uh, verkir, v e r k e h r, and in that specific content. Context, it means road traffic, but it can also mean intercourse. And so that's the last last word of his story. It, to him, it feels like an ejaculation. Hmm. He's finally, he just pumps this thing out, and it's he feels fantastic about it. Hmm. Right? Yeah, and then he sleeps. <laughs> but the judgment, the judgment is a story of a man who it opens with him writing to his friend um, who's in Russia, and he says, hey, I'm going to get married. I met this woman. I'm going to get married. And then he goes into his dad's room and he um, starts telling his dad about this. And his dad is like, his dad, his, at first his dad is old and feeble and he's like, oh, really? Is that guy really your friend? You haven't really told him any. This is the first time you're telling him? And then his dad, he, he, he picks his dad up and he puts his dad in bed. And then his dad bursts out of bed and is like, you bastard, you're not gonna lose, you, you sh you're not going to get married. I sentence you to death. Go drown in a river. And so the son, obeying his father, mm -hmm. leaves the yes, house. Yes, sir, sir. And then goes, drowns himself in the river. Huh. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of things going on there. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Hey, you. Mm -hmm. Get your damn hands off her. <laughs> and also, <laughs> go drown yourself in the river. Is it a short story or? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, is there you know. more to this story? No, I mean that's in, in as you know there. Okay, there so are, I think we're missing a lot of the kind of uh, um, subtext. The, yeah, the subtext and the, and the uh, the meta commentary of this story, right? So this is not just a story of a man who falls in love and tells his dad about it, and the dad k tells him to kill himself. This well, is... it's like he likes this girl and he's thinking that his dad is going to ruin it for him because his dad is this overbearing, dominating personality, I suppose. 
Perhaps. Uh, sure. But I think Perhaps. it's also good, it's good. also <laughs> I think it's more good guess, uh, John. Maybe a commentary on um, well, something I'm not smart enough to figure out right now. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, honestly? What do you, what do you feel like it is? Well, I, I've never heard this story, so I don't. I know I haven't read it. What so do you I think it is? Maybe you, but too I feel, but, into but I feel like the, of what I about what what I know about Kafka is that his stories are so absurd and so um, symbolic that they cannot be taken on face value. Mm. So my my instinct is that this story is not a face value story, because it's it's lacking so much of what makes a normal narrative palatable or interesting i think also a lot of uh you know uh very smart people and you could say perhaps somewhat autistic sorts of people um can find you know the uh the things that you can get knowledgeable about you know through book learning and things like this um to be safe and solid and rules are solid and stuff like that and then you meet somebody where it's all emotion and impulse, and then you're like very threatened by uh, your sense of um, the rules and structure being threatened. Uh huh. That make any sense? No, I lost you. I get what you're saying, but I don't. Uh... Especially back then. I mean, you've got nothing but books, right? And you've got nothing but you know Talmud and the law and rules right. and all these right. fables and stuff like that. But and that's all good. Until you actually get tempted by something that is like less logical, like which is being attracted to a woman in real time and in real life. Oh, I see. So you're saying that the uh, allure of real flesh and blood attraction and love is so it's hard to reconcile with everything compared with the normal, uh, with the black and white letter on page. Yes, I think maybe that he's going through that in that story and. That's interesting. What do you think, Matt? Matt, you're the profiler. Well, so um, I mean, I guess we can I can jump a little bit into the analysis now. And so, so what? So what this story ha- has is is a very seemingly normal start. A man writing to his friend, putting his dad to bed, and then suddenly the dad jumps out and says, "You know, what do you? You're he says you're defiling your mother's memory." This tramp you're running off with, who's gonna care for me? I sense mm. you to I sent you sense you to drown in the and it's called the judgment, right? <laughs> well, so he's clearly, take care of him then too. <laughs> you know, yeah, but you know, it, that's not part of he's, Yeah. He's on one. And and so uh this is for <laughs> Robertson writes about how around this time and slightly before it, and certainly influencing Kafka is uh, Roland Barthes writes about the difference between early literature and modern literature, which would be modern in this time. Early literature before this is writerly texts. What is happening around this time is readerly texts. And this is idea... Because the takes, increase of literacy, right? Before, so it was, it was literacy cer- cer- was certainly a priestly... That. Yeah. Certainly that. But, it, be, right, priestly. Because the, the difference between a, a writerly text and a readerly text, this idea is taken from Brecht's distinction of his own theater, which is active theater for the spectator as opposed to what he called culinary theater. And so culinary theater is writerly theory, which is to say they tell you everything. Readerly theory and active theater, readerly text and active theater, is where you, the reader are part of it because you're trying to figure out what right. it means. Oh, so right. instead of being told everything that is happening, it you there's there's unknowns and you're mm-hmm. allowed to kind of figure Reading out between the lines as yes. it were. And so what Kafka is doing is he's giving you the old style, here's what you know, and then suddenly a it's switch flips. It. Brilliant. And and you don't there's no reasoning but why but why this man's dad does this. Mm-hmm. So why well, do you think he does it, right? Why do why do you think he is? so? Suddenly now you're taking you're an active part of the story, right? Hmm. Right. Because you're it's, asking questions. Mm-hmm. You know what this is, John, and I'll put it out there for people like us who are dumb. <laughs> it's the top spinning at the end of Inception. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Figure it out. What do you think? Yeah. 
figure it out, stupid. Yeah. Uh, Kafka would later be described as a conservative modernist. So he's using. They were going to say Kafka would later be described as the Christopher Nolan of turn of the century <laughs> literature. <laughs> he's using 19th century models. This is from Emerson. Uh, using 19th century models with superficially readable narratives, but perplexing perplexing the reader with psychological and epistemological dogmas uh, enigmas. Hmm. So, so this detective... is somebody who is using. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but no, no. just for my own clarification, this is somebody who is using. Uh, I don't want to say outdated, but previous generation form with well, things people would know to elicit a next generation response yeah is that, is that right well, well he's, he's using, using something that's familiar and he's using the familiar the, to set up an unfamiliar um to break pattern. he's using it as something to break away from right he's saying you think you know what to expect and showing now, black here's the to elicit white right yes. or showing white to elicit black mm-hmm Right. That's interesting, man. That's fucking interesting. Huh. Smart people, man. Smart people. Uh, I'm not one. Proud to say it. <laughs> Me either, man. I don't know. Barely know what's going on. Uh, so, keep going. Keep going. Keep, man, this is fascinating. Please. It is. So, um, uh, uh, so th- that's the judgment. And, you know, the part of, part of his thinking into that is, you know, he... he Himself, he expects to marry, and everybody expects him to marry. Um, but, he, of course, he doesn't. He can't handle that as well. And he writes about how, in order to marry this, he writes this later in 1919, he writes this. The longest thing he ever wrote, I believe, is a 100-page manifesto, basically, about his father. <laughs> and, how his, and so this, this idea comes from me. But he writes about how, he needs to marry to remove himself from his father, but also that by marrying, he would then have one other thing in common, in with, common his with his father. That's brilliant. That might be the smartest thing he's ever said. <laughs> and I've never read it, but that is mad fucking insightful. Wow. I think it's... Uh, Damn, that's good. I, I like that he, a lot. I think he also shared quite a... Uh, a number of letters with his father, even though they had this horribly tense relationship. I, I mean, I assume he did. You know, um, eventually he would move out. This whole thing, the whole thing ab- about his father, he wrote, and he could not was... give it to his father, but he gave it to his <sighs> mother to give to his father, and oh, she God. she would not do it. Wow. Um, both his sister and his mother read it, and they were like, "Don't you shouldn't give this to me." <laughs> he he wouldn't like that. Wow, that's fucking interesting. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine what it would have done to him? <laughs> You're killing your father, Franz. <laughs> killing your father. I mean, it'd just be fascinating to see, like that he was willing. Good to Morgan to you, sir. <laughs> you know, the guy's probably slurping on a bone or something, and they're like, "Oh God." Hey, uh, uh what's his name again? Herman. Herman. <laughs> Franz has a 100-page letter about just dissecting your brutishness. And it's the longest thing he's ever written. He really gets a lot right here. Sick. It's crazy. Uh, so it's incestuous. <laughs> so, what? So, what? So, so he, he, he expects to get married, but he's insecure about it. And also, he, he has all these feelings about sex and love. Um, that as Robertson writes that it makes him feel like a wandering Jew, senselessly drawn, senselessly wandering through a senselessly Another dirty world. Right? right, dirty world. And but but Lost Kafka tribe. wrote Kafka wrote that it was senselessly drawn, senselessly wandering through a senseless, senselessly dirty world. But he also wrote that sex had uh, something in the, of the air that was breathed in paradise before the fall. So he loved it, but he just. Didn't there was couldn't was, shake off his own. He was constantly in the refractory period, I guess. You know. It, oh, oh, Matt, very good insight. Wait, I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat that insight? Uh, uh, so, did you hear the, the the paradise before the fall thing? Yes, I did. So so I, it 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 almost feels like when he was having sex, it was amazing. But everything when he every time he wasn't having sex, it, it's the, he had that sh- that refractory shame of. Oh, isn't this filthy? 
Oh, he was constantly look at, look at in the refractory done. period. Yeah. Which is for you, John, the period in which you close all your browser <laughs> windows in shame. Yeah, which I never do. <laughs> it's an issue. Oh, you, yeah, you're they're all they're all still open. You're sick. Do you know I how have, to close windows? No, I have I have more of those windows open than my physical <laughs> windows. Because you, uh, right you only have one. Yeah, no, there's two. Very thank you man. very much. Oh, well. uh, um, I I would Matt, also. I like that a lot. Yeah, well, like Aaron, hold, I... wait for my insight and shut up. <laughs> uh, but you're gonna like it even more, pal. <laughs> <laughs> what I was gonna say is the refractory period is also the uh, all of the time where there is um, uh, structure. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. And 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 the other time is just uh, you know animal primitive uh, instinct in uh, and chaos, pure and... obscenity and lewd lasciviousness. But seriously, I mean, yeah. you know, that's the part where it's all you know fucking up in the air. And then come to your senses. Any other time hey, is nice. is like, um, yeah, come come to your come senses. to your senses. Come come to your senses. Come to your senses. <laughs> But you know what I mean? It's like yeah. there was a time you go like, oh, okay, so now what kind of formatted uh, companionship do we have? Because can we go back to the part where nothing made sense and I was spouting yeah, nonsense? Yeah, well, that, I think that's the beautiful part, right, is that, you know, uh, uh, for example, like, you know, uh, dogs don't have the knowledge of their own death, <laughs> right? right? So, like, that, <laughs> what's the more natural state? <laughs> is the more natural state the part where you're heaving and hoeing, sweating and breathing in each other's mouths while you're bumping uglies? Mm -hmm. Or is it the part after where you are <laughs> hyper aware of the absurdity of the situation <laughs> and That's the so funny, dude. disgust of your own sweaty bodies. And me and you. Which which is more real or natural? We, I don't know. All three of us have had talks about when our dad said just insanely fucking harsh shit to us. Oh, <laughs> brutal shit. And you I, know, I think so, that's sometimes, the only thing he said. <laughs> sometimes it's not even really meant to be. <laughs> but I remember my fucking sitting at the ta the table one time with my dad, and uh, the dog is on the floor. It's the childhood dog I grew up with. Beautiful dog. dog, Juno, golden retriever, the best family dog you could ever grow up with in the world. She she break up fights and like you know just Juno what? like Alaska or Juno like the uh, Greek uh, Roman god. The Roman god. Got it. And uh. uh my dad, when we were sitting there, my dad was like, you see that dog? I go, yeah. And he goes, dog has no idea it's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> was that's, like, that's such a dad. That's a perfect like, dad move. Perfect it, dad move. It's one of those things perfect. where I was, I was so relieved and yet so depressed over it. You know? No, just cut you. Perfect and, dad quote. And mm -hmm. I think he said it with envy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course yeah, probably, he did. Yeah, yeah. You know? no, there's no other, tr there's no other reality other than him saying that with pure envy. Yeah, yeah. and respect. Yeah, it was, it was, and, and just like his mind being blown. Like, can you imagine that fucking thing? The no bliss, clue, no clue about the, <laughs> yeah. about the, the imminent bliss doom. Of it. The ignorance <laughs> is bliss. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry, Matt. We got way off track there, but right. please all right. continue. Uh, so, so you know that uh, uh, this obsession both with um, sex is gross, and also I love it, right? <laughs> I love it because it's gross. Uh, it also, <laughs> it, it, in 1912, he he, uh, he um, begins something, he starts doing something that he would do on and off. Um, I, I believe he starts it now. But, but he's, he goes to a nudist colony in the mountains. It's part of the whole von der Vogel. Um, everybody was healthier if they're naked outdoors. It's a God. spiritual retreat. Yeah, and you gotta get up in the freezing mountains. And... Um, you know, later in life, he 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 would he would call out the absurdity of um, someone uh, insulting religious belief, and yet he's like, well, what about all of the seminars and the the, the things at these re the ever these retreats as well? You know. Yeah. But 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 also during this time, there's this uh, um there's this idea of Jewish manliness. Nice. And there's a Zionist magazine that he reads, and 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 it's all about you know if, if we as Jews are going to get over stigmas about our intellect, we need you know, and not just that, but also for ourselves, we need to work on our bodies. We need to be manly. And this is a thing, of course. Then you see later 
this is a thing filtering through much of society as the the manliness of the of the Aryan German. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. No, the, that's 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 very very uh, prescient of them yes. to see that back then. That's well, and also you know after this period of emphasis on Jewish manliness, you had Jews do- uh, dominating. I, I dare say boxing. Yes, mm-hmm. and oh, yeah. basketball, mm-hmm. a track and field for a period of time. Um, and much of that has to do with socioeconomic status, but also I think there's some, maybe perhaps some overlap with the, the emphasis of it because basketball and Judy and, and American Jews goes hand in hand. Well, now you could even with, say it is in the, 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 uh, Mossad, uh, special ops, uh, military. Oh, thing. oh yeah. IDF. But I mean, they're, they're say considered, what you want, but those guys know how to beat the shit out of some people. They're Rock considered. Macau? Yeah. I mean, they really are, you know, kind of like the CIA of the CIA. Yeah. Yeah, just really they don't hardcore. fuck around. Yeah. They do not fuck around. No. Uh, so um, I don't know if it's uh, I don't I'm not exactly sure of the timeline, but <clears throat> also in 1912 he writes uh, the metaphor the metamorphosis, aka the transformation. That was in 1912. 1912. It'd be published in 19, 1915. Um, he's he's 29. God. And. God. Um, so the metaphor, metamorphosis for, for anyone who, who doesn't know, it may, may be um, his most, he has two stories that are probably his, his, his most famous, and this is one of them. And um, it is about a man who wakes up, and when he does, he is a, he's a bug. Yeah. I'd say it's and, the pivotal work. It's the one I yeah. most Cock- cockroaches. know. Cockroaches. And uh, um, uh, I'll just read uh, 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 the opening, the opening to it. And uh, as Gregor Samsa awoke one morning after disturbing dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into an enormous bug. And that's how it opens. And it doesn't, get, doesn't make any more sense from there. No, it gets crazier. As he was lying on his back, which was hard, as if made of armor, his many legs waved helplessly in front of his eyes. And that's his truncated version. But basically, the, sto- <laughs> the, sto- the story is... And that's the trunk. Did you just read two sentences and go, you get the rest? <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, so what happens is then uh, he's, he's a traveling salesman who is keeping his uh, family afloat. Um, his dad is retired. Uh, he has a sister, and um, his, he doesn't show up to work. And so his boss comes, or one of his bosses comes over and says, hey, uh, get out of here. you got to come to work. Uh, and then when he doesn't answer the door, his boss is like, you're not even, you're stealing from them. You're stealing from us, aren't you? You're not even that good of a worker. And then they open up the door. They see the bug. Everybody screams. Um, and, you know, they, they rec- I think his sister recognizes his, it, it's him. The family tries to live life normally. Um, eventually, they just get used to it. They start moving all of their extra junk into his room. They take in three boarders to help pay their rent. Um, and the... the but, but something that's very interesting is that the the insect never recognizes, for the most part, how absurd this is. As soon as they mm-hmm. wake up as the insect, that's it. That's what that, there was never anything else. That's just their everything is normal to them as an insect. Yeah. And there are some moments where they see they're looking outside, and it does seem there's very human stuff about them. But um, unlike the other story where it went from normal to weird this one synthesized started weird yeah. it is it with both it had it combines both the normal and the weird and it synthesizes mm. them in a way that is not a stop and go like uh like the judgment interesting and that's something we can get to more um but 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 there's you know late and then of course at the end um, he um, he he scares the boarders off because the boarders are making fun of his sister's uh, uh, music playing. They're making and, fun of the human sister's music and not the cockroach in the master bedroom. Right, well, because he's hidden away from them, and then I think he he makes some scene and he, and he comes out and um, he scares everybody and his dad. <laughs> you guys want to play some baseball? <laughs> that kind of shit. Yeah. And, and Gregor's dad uh, throws apples at him to scare him off, and one of them lands in his back, and it oh, festers. His yeah, and it festers, and the wound festers, and, oh, God. and eventually kills him. And the family, mm. after as soon An as they find, day. they find him dead, they cross themselves, um, and then they go on holiday, and they they're free. 
they, they forget are, about they, they are free from their son who has been dragging them down this insect and they just they as 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 the story ends the parents discover that their daughter has this lovely vivacious body and she's going to go find a man and they're all going to have a great <laughs> life wow now that they've gotten this yeah, insect yeah, son of theirs out of the way bug son is gone now our hot fertile human daughter <laughs> nubile is going to go out there and fuck some guys well, I mean, also, chicks. Uh, she can <laughs> pass pass Judaism as the mother. That's very interesting, mm, John. Yeah, you like that observation? Yeah, right? <laughs> as a male, he's useless. Yeah, in terms of passing oh, Judaism down the generations, that's fucking interesting. Mm -hmm. Ooh, John's cutting out. And we're back. <laughs> Sorry, so, technical difficulties. My bad. Oh, good. Uh, so, so you, the metaphor, metamorphosis, um, transformation. Maybe published in 1915, but he writes in 1912. Uh, 1912, he, he's writing to Felice, um, his girlfriend, and he, he writes about how he sees parents as persecutors, um, and he says they parents only want to drag one down to them. In the old times from which one would like to ascend with a sigh of relief. They want to do this out of love, of course, but that's what's so awful. God Ooh. almighty. Move out. Move out. Uh, Move out. 31. It is, a very, it is very much... Yes. Um, it, it, does have, yes. it does have the air of somebody who's lived with their parents for too long. Yes. He's 29, yes. Uh, but, yeah. but, you know. I now it, believe they are my most fervent persecutor. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, no, no, you they know. feed me and shelter me. And... <laughs> I mean, he does have a job, and this writing is, is starting to work out. And, and he also, but, you know, with, this, with this, his writing, he recognizes from the metamorphosis how important it is for uh, uh, not just himself to be productive, but that this is, it's good. And his, his and uh, his friends, uh, I believe, agree. The work, the, the work, the piece, and and he's starting to understand that this is a thing for me. Ah. And um, Felice, uh, she uh, she shows one of his letters to a handwriting expert, um, and the the writer, the the expert says, "I detect a literary interest." And Kafka responds to this. He says, "I do not have literary interests. I consist of literature." I am nothing else and cannot be anything else. <laughs> and he later writes, he says, the tremendous world I have inside my head, I, 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 the tremendous world I have inside my head, but how to free myself and free it without being torn to pieces. And a thousand times rather be torn to pieces than retain it in me or bury it. That indeed is why I'm here. That is quite clear to me. Jesus. He's, 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 he's formed an idea of who he is. He's 29 now. Yes, but it also sounds like he's terrified of like letting his imagination run wild. He's he's terrified. He's, so he's terrified of not letting yes. it run wild. Yes. Ah. And he's worried that a relationship will interrupt his writing. Um, he's he, uh, Someone says they'd like to sit by him while he writes, and then so in response to that, he imagines a desk in the middle of a basement cellar, unreachable by all people. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Oh boy. And, and he writes to Brode at this time something that um, is often quoted as part of Metamorphosis, but it, it is not. It's just written to Brode at this time. He writes, A picture of my existence would show a useless wooden stake covered in snow, stuck loosely at a slant in the ground, in a plowed field on the edge of a vast open plain on a dark winter night. Jesus Christ. This is a man constantly in between... <laughs> Response from Max... Take it down a notch. <laughs> <laughs> Chill out, man. <laughs> so look, relax. Man, relax. He said, I am relaxed. And I said, no, you're not. Oh, boy. 1913, he, um, in one of his, um, I believe one of his letters, he describes a circular saw cutting his body into strips of meat. Huh? Really? An idea he had. 
Uh, a, 1913, a diary entry from 1913 describes women's bodies as, uh, quote, exploding sex sexuality. Hmm. I buy that. And their, quote, natural uncleanliness. Uh, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's always two things. Yeah, they're exploding with sexuality. Also, they're sick. <laughs> <laughs> and it's insect. And then in, in 1913, he's, he's reading more Kierkegaard. And he reads oh, Kierkegaard. For... Of course he's reading fucking Kierkegaard. Yeah, of course. And he reads the Book of the Judge. And in that, Kierkegaard writes about his struggle to balance marriage and religious commitment. And uh, Kierkegaard... You know, Kafka marriage def- is a religious commitment. <laughs> well, unless you view religion as uh, something even bigger. And, and Kierkegaard... Uh, Kafka definitely felt something between his... Mar- you know... He he is now engaged to Felice at this point, and he's feeling this about his own marriage and writing. Kierkegaard eventually breaks off his engagement, and Kafka would would just let his life fallow until someone else dealt with it. <laughs> <laughs> he just let it fester, yeah, um, like the apple in his carapace. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, but but in 1913, he does publish his first book, The Meditation. Is 18 stories he wrote between 1904 and 1912. So he finally has this, you know, it's not just publication in a magazine. He has a, a physical... A collection of something. A collection. Then in 1914, he's 31. He moves out of his parents' place. Now he's living alone for the first time. And for the first time, Felice breaks off their engagement. Um... And, and 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 Kafka writes about you know around this time him and Felice went furniture shopping and he said the entire time all he could think of was tombstones. Oh God. And <laughs> what a piece of shit. <laughs> I mean, it is it is a a repeating theme for everybody. He's so emo. Mm. Well, I mean, it's, what, yes. it, but it's yes. it's also just the it's the exact same thing as you know Frank the Tank being like Home Depot, uh, Bed Bath and Beyond. I don't know if we'll have time. You know, yeah. Yeah. that is the <laughs> that's, that's the that's the, the tombstone. You know, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> what's up, Mike? Um, <laughs> that thing. Let's keep that on the down low. It's not exactly street it's legal. Street legal. I took off the restrictor plate. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. <laughs> hey, Mike. That's, How perfect uh, is that? How perfect is so, that? That's retarded. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's the whole thing of, uh, you know, if you A if man you're, begrudgingly if, accepting his fate? Is that what you're saying? A man who's like. It, no, it, it's a, it's a, it's. I think the instinctive I think w- thing of like being neutered by doing domestic things and accepting yes. uh creating a uh, wholesome yes. family life is like But feeling resentful for doing it? Yeah, yeah because I'm a fucking coyote dog. Right. You know, I'm, like that type I'm of an um, I'm a bronco unable to be tamed. Right. Yeah. Et cetera, but, but it, so except he's so not forth. thinking that. He's he's thinking I'm not <laughs> above this and not even I don't deserve this. <laughs> I'm just uncomfortable. He, he, yes. he, he writes that his engagement makes him feel bound like a criminal. Yes. And, but don't you and, think that's even still an extension of that same thing, no matter how oh, intellectual oh, the exact same he tries thread, to make but it? But said by yeah. a, a different person. More of a thread of the arachnid descending. <laughs> a thread of the spider's silk can be beautiful, but it can also ensnare you in its... V- <laughs> Come into my parlor, said the spider to Franz. So, um, you, but, but he writes to process these things. And the, the end of his engagement... He describes it as a as a fallout, and as people are his his the the friends of his of Felice and his uh, friends they're pestering him with why why what happened why why did it not work out, and from this he then writes two more stories. One is the trial, which is his most famous work, and the other one is the penal colony, which is get the fuck out of here. Brutal. The trial, the trial yeah. is his most famous work. I think so. Yeah. Really. If not metamorphosis, yeah, I think I am. 
I I'm dumb, so I don't know, but I've always thought of metamorphosis being. His I would most... say the, the metamorphosis. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. But um, tell us, could you tell us a little bit about the trial? So, um, well, the trial and the penal colony they both feature incomprehensible trials and and a, and a harsh <laughs> and a harsh justice in response to that. The 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 trial begins. Someone must have been telling lies about Joseph K. For without having done anything, Joe wrong, K. <laughs> yes. Look, he's not so the pussy boss. The, the, same. the pussy boss. <laughs> he's straight. He's not the pussy <laughs> boss. It's all fucking lies. <laughs> he's straight as fuck. He's he's almost uh, the most bland straight type. <laughs> Blonde, loving, big tit, like like Bobby Fish's uh, <laughs> delight. He, he's basically a buxom blonde woman. <laughs> he's as he's, he's straight as an arrow. <laughs> His pussy's never been penetrated. <laughs> right on. You, you don't see, in all Ooh. of his stories, so he goes from, eventually his stories... They go from names, full names, to Joseph K. And then eventually one of his last stories is just K. Hmm. Really? And he just, you know, eventually he just gets there. And there's even uh, some stories that the, the guy's just called the Traveler. He doesn't have a name. It's just the mm -hmm. protagonist. Right. Just, but it, so this one opens, the trial begins. Someone must have been telling lies about Joseph K. For without having done anything wrong, he was arrested one morning. Mm. And it opens with him waking up. Trying to start his day, there's a knock on his door. He shows up, and there's these two wardens who then tell him that he is uh, guilty, and they, he says, "Of what?" And they say, "Well, you know, you must know. You know what <laughs> you did, and figure it out, it, idiot." It's the story of him. He he never the the protagonist never said he 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 says, "Well, I you know, there are times where he says, I must I must I'm, I'm not guilty,' but he never." Uh, goes and tries to prove it. He just insists that he isn't, and then they say he is, and eventually he accepts it, and he tries to work within the system to, uh, not, uh, to not have to deal with it. And, but there's all of these different, uh, uh, basically, catacombs of justice that he must go through, and then it's all incomprehensible. It's, it's, it's a very Catch-22 type thing where they say things like, well, we wouldn't have come for you if you weren't guilty. That's just how it works. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what you're guilty of, but we're here, so you must be guilty. Right. Mm -hmm. And he Unless says... you've of, got something he, to hide. He says of what? And they say, well, does it matter? The fact that you are guilty means there is something. And so this goes on and on, and um, everybody he meets, you know, is part of this whole process, this infrastructure of guilt. Mm. And um, even the his defense attorney is 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 someone who then ab uh, almost uh, abuses him in order to prove that the defense attorney is 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 needed. The defense attorney takes advantage of him because the mm -hmm. judges are trying to get rid of the defense attorney because everybody who's here is guilty. So why they'd even need a defense attorney? Hmm. Mm. And so there's all of these machinations and levels of of organization that feed into the eventual outcome, which is the guilty mm. man, is then brought to a grave that is already dug and killed in it. <sighs> killed huh. in it? Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, 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 and some and, dark and, shit. <laughs> and, and while Joseph at times... He well, the, the grave's already dug. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. Mr. K, if that is your real name. I was killed in my own predetermined grave. <laughs> It was the only time I felt that I had a place to belong. <laughs> the yeah. irony is palpable. Mm -hmm. Destiny so, so, but, was written. Sorry. There, no, no, no. There, there, there are, are two systems that Kafka draws from for this dynamic. And the German Empire at the time had this, this, this Kantian philosophy of law. Assumption of guilt and more responsibility. And therefore, the whole point, if you are arrested, you are guilty. And you're morally responsible. And therefore, the whole point was to determine what just at that point what the punishment is. Mm -hmm. If you are arrested, then then the whole point of this court is to figure out the punishment. Because, of course, you're guilty. Right. Right. 
But the Austrian legal code was about intent and motivation. And therefore, you could be guilty without ever having done anything illegal. Right. Oh, thought crime. Yeah. And so both of these, they both focus on the criminal and not the crime. Mm. So if you combine these two, you get the trial where you get a man who's simply guilty by being arrested because only the guilty are arrested, and he was arrested because, quote, the authorities do not go in search of guilt but are drawn to it. Mm. Jesus Christ. And so it, the moment he's arrested, it's immaterial, whatever he did. And he is never told what he did, and nor yeah. does he ever fight to learn what he did, because yeah. it doesn't matter. Huh. Oh, boy, what a nightmare. But there is, I mean, there's also something, I think, probably in commentary about, you know, judicial things like that. Oh, where, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how you feel, but, you know, when it comes to, let's say, rumors about somebody... You go, like Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, or even or even people like let's say that we know or whatever, like in comedy or something like that, where you just go, go like, okay. Do you want me to say a name? No, no. But I'm just uh, saying okay. I'm just saying like where you go like there's a party that goes hmm. a lot of smoke there. Oh, I got names. <laughs> but you don't but you know what I'm saying? Where you go like uh like it's not it's not a trial. But there's a part of you that goes like, "Is something uh, right?" Well, I, I suppose there is. <laughs> you know I, mean, I, mean? I don't. I don't think this is what Kafka was saying. What is? What is it when the court of public opinion becomes the official court? Well, but it just That's, shows you how that can get out of hand. Is what I'm it saying. It can get out of hand, but but I you think know, it's there, also it's an scientific... indictment of the situation that he was living in at the time, which is a a true dystopian nightmare, which is when. Everybody is in this kind of cube bureaucracy of it. everything is compartmentalized as well. Well, I don't ask why they send me to arrest somebody because I assume that everybody they send me to arrest is guilty. Yeah, and we also decided and then when you're it was a Jew. Court, well, it's always the Jews. We always uh, so we decided it was a Jew, and then you go like, well, why? There's no evidence. And you go like, well, oh, well, well, yeah, this is what just, the paper says, and the paper it says this because the people that make the papers are told. So by the now people it's a. Uh, well, his name, his name is Joseph K. I don't know if Jewishness ever uh, uh, comes up in the story. I can't. No, remember. I'm saying in his in his personal uh, background that might be where. Perhaps, this kind and, of and thing. in this case, the the minor, Jew, the Jewish person can stand in. It's whatever the minority is. It. I haven't read it, so I don't know. I'm not <laughs> going to say anything. But it is it is a nightmare scenario in which it is we don't arrest people unless they're guilty, and they don't. These people don't come to the court. To prove their innocence, they come to determine their punishment. And it is this kind right. of, there is no chain of responsibility. Yes. It is a chain of bureaucracy. Right. And what I'm and, saying is yes. that the there's a lot of smoke there theory. If you just hear about it, then you can just assume, oh yeah, if everybody says it. Oh, where there's smoke, there's more smoke. Yeah. Like if you know I like that. You but know, there's, like where there's smoke, there's more smoke, and there's more smoke, and then I guess there's the idea of fire, but that's not really what we're here to find out. Right. What we're here is to punish people. Mm -hmm. But you go like it's very easy for you to go like, well, I've never had the cloud of suspicion on me for anything, and they do. So what's that about? Mm -hmm. And then if it's if it's you know several clouds, then you go like, well, let's just assume guilt, and then that's not really a scientific ap approach to justice. Well, yeah, it's it's kind of the flip side. Um, same nightmare, but it is the kind of um, complement to the uh, Patriot Act. If you have nothing to hide, then what are you worried about? Was well, very much thing. There was a, a right. thing I listened to this week, which is, um, you know, that we're told this idea of trust is well, open your coat and show. And yeah. It's that yeah. I trust. Take but off the, your the, shoes. The put real, everything through the scanner. The real trust. Is not having to Making ask that you. question, yeah. Because yeah. you, the and presumption you of, by by saying you have nothing to hide, that is a presumption of guilt. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, you're all guilty, so. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I carry <laughs> drugs with me all the time. Of course, no, I am drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Salvador Dali. <laughs> 
Oh, is uh, that a quote? Dr. Dr. That's a, that is a Sal- <laughs> that is a Salvador Dali quote. I am drugs. <laughs> oh, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good stuff that is great stuff drugs am i holding drugs i am drugs <laughs> am. <laughs> is that, was that your woody allen that's woody <laughs> allen as Salvador Dali. Of, 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 i am drugs <laughs> so uh so that's not- my that's my that's my um nom de plume i am drugs <laughs> so uh, uh 1914 he's 31 and he, he says, while he's writing the trial, he, he writes to Broad, I believe. He says, I have found meaning. My regular, empty, mad, bachelor-like life has a justification. Hmm. He is finally, he has fallen fully into... Um, Being a turbo later. whore. Yeah, in essence. Yeah. Uh, in 1915, he so is hot. handed his only ever literary prize. It is not awarded to him. What it is mean? handed What does that mean? Him. It's just handed. Yes. So in 1915... He got a hand job. (laughs) Yeah. A nice story. I'll jerk you off. (laughs) (laughs) Tell your friends about this. Read a story about this. You you motherfucker, you. (laughs) Hurry up and come with your big Jew dick and we can get out of here. (laughs) Dear Christ. It was a... It was a German thing, not an Italian thing. But the the <laughs> the idea is the same. Maybe you, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you. Can. I'll hurry up and jerk your big circumcised Jewish dick, <laughs> and you can accept your award and get out of here. Maybe, perhaps. <laughs> Kafka does at one point. He does. He writes about seeing a. I believe it's like a cousin's kid or a, a friend's kid being circumcised, and oh, he yeah? describes. He says like the whole event. Is 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 just the whole thing? For some reason, they're all his whole family's there. Everybody's there to watch this. At a bris, yeah, yeah, it's a family affair. And he's like, "This is so absurd. This it, it, it's such a historical weirdness to him." He's like, "This this is just going to be some some <laughs> foregone historical story of absurdity." It's a foregone this conclusion. So, this is just so weird. It's a foreskin conclusion. <laughs> I'm going to tuck this away in my memory <laughs> as one of the most absurd things I've ever seen. His foreskin was forlorn, and it was a foregone, forsaken, forever. Hey, I mean, the child squealed like a long pig. <laughs> long? <laughs> forlorn for his uh, schmegma, or as we called it, dick cheese. <laughs> <laughs> the angel of death passed over his foreskin. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, Matt. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jews and Christians. I should say, I, I br- briefly, briefly um, okay, so this literary prize. Uh, so um, the, the, it's the third ever, it was the third ever Fontaine Prize for Best Modern Narrator. That's the translation I have, at least. And there was only one judge, and the judge basically was like, I want these two authors to talk. So he gave the prize to one author, and he said, hey, can you give the cash prize to Kafka? And Kafka uh, was like... So the, the nominal prize was given to the other guy, but the money was given to Kafka. He asked the prize winner to give the money, because uh, the other guy, the guy was a millionaire. Yeah, and he was like, why don't you give to. Kafka the money? Uh, and Kafka... Huh. Um, <laughs> Kafka was kind of insulted by it, but he took well, the money. Well, well, I mean that is that is. Did insulting. he take the money? I don't think he did. No money. Well, no, he, was, he was persuaded. He was persuaded. He had to. He had to be persuaded to accept the money. It is hmm. insulting. It's emasculating and it's insulting. Well, was it because? His, but also, twenty uh, bucks. Twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> was it because his work was so uh, verboten? <laughs> I, I don't. You know, Joe, I'm quite verboten. <laughs> this, this is um, <laughs> this is the letter that he wrote um, to uh, someone else about it. He, he, Kafka writes, It is not easy to write to someone for whom you have not received direct messages and to thank him without knowing exactly what. <laughs> <laughs> no DMs? Come on. Yeah. Uh, thanks for... If you uh, could slide ever- into them, that would be great. <laughs> I think the penal colony uh, is something he wrote the year before, uh, uh, right, with the trial. 
And I think it's a very fascinating Kafka work because it's the story of a man that is just, I think I believe it's just called The Traveler. And he shows up to this penal colony. And Kafka was, um, he supported the Boers in the Boer War. Mm. Um, and this is a, a story that follows in that. It, it's, it's in... Um, it's always a punitive theme, though. Yes. And, and Trial, judgment, penal colony. It's yes. always... Yeah. yeah. The penal colony. And the next story he writes is The Advocate. Um, Jesus Christ. This, uh, but the penal colony is, is um, uh, the traveler shows up um, to this colony, and as he shows up, a, a soldier is, is about to be put into a ma- machine. And the soldier, what happened to him is he, he, he fell asleep um, uh, on his post, and he was whipped to wake up. And as he woke up and was whipped, he fought back. And so his punishment was now to be put in this machine. And what the machine does is it's this, basically a sandwich. Uh-huh. Of there is a panini a, press in in essence, yeah. And the top part of the panini is not a grill, but it is a a a series of of glass um, needles that will then no. carve the judgment in. The man doesn't know what he what the judgment is, what he has been put into it for. It will be carved into his skin over the course of twelve hours until it drives Jesus. all the way through him and kills him. That so is a nightmare scenario. The commander says to the traveler, and he says, um, what do you think? <laughs> and, and the traveler's like, this isn't just at all. This is madness. It's punitive. And the commander goes, oh. And he shows him a picture, and he says, well, then I am in violation. And the traveler goes, I don't see anything. It's just a scribble. And the commander goes, no, it says, my, 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 the one thing I had to do was be just. That's what it says on this scribble. Hmm. And so then the commander takes off the soldier from the machine and puts and himself puts in himself it. into it, and then the Whoa. machine malfunctions, drives straight through the commander, drives a bolt through his head, and then deposits him in the grave. So is the tra- the, the traveler as the outsider? Yes, is the the. Uh, observer who is truly impartial is that is that kind of what it's in, getting? in essence and, and and it's one of the very few stories with this kind of torturous I guess ending. It's a glimmer of hope. Where 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 the, well, yeah, I mean, this is the one of the very few where the the person who stands up succeeds against the the hegemony. Yes, and 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 and, and but it, it's also unlike the trial. Mm. He fight. He he does fight back. He doesn't accept yeah. the. He doesn't accept accept what he's told is the truth. Hmm. He doesn't accept the organizational <clears throat> routine because he's traveled. Yes, yeah. I mean, he's well, I mean, the traveler, the traveler also, you know, it might be the kind of deus ex machina of, you know, or even just God Himself being like, "Hey, this is all fucked up. What the fuck are you doing here?" You know what I mean? He, he could be, but but the, right. the commander already has this. He has this diagram that he's told he has to be just. And sure, once he yeah. once he has violates that, well then he must go into the machine. Yeah, but it does seem yearning for an understanding person. Certainly, yes, absolutely. Yeah, compared to the other stuff, which is very interesting. Uh, Nineteen seventeen, um, his engagement with Felice. Uh, this is the second time it breaks off, and this time it is for good. Over their five years, they would only ever meet in person um, a handful of weeks over five hmm. years. Their entire relationship was spent letter writing. Jesus. Even though he, she was in Berlin, he was in Prague. It, it, it was like I don't know a six seven hour journey. I can't remember, but it was uh, just enough. Too long. For, it was just enough for him to be like, "This Get is going to be great." <laughs> <laughs> we never had a different area code. It's not cheating, bro. Uh huh. It's going to be so hot. Oh, oh man, God. you have aged. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> what? Nice. Uh, in uh, 1917, he writes a short story, The Advocate, which the main character, Bucephalus, um, was a Macedonian war horse under Alexander the Great, but has since, through study, metamorphosized, has become a human lawyer. And the only <laughs> way you know that it is a horse is there are various people this throughout the story. Talk. There's like, yeah, there's one guy who was an expert in race horses who was like, wow, you know, that. This that, lawyer's dick is huge, <laughs> man. Exactly. I'm just a simple racehorse. <laughs> Metamorphosized into a common lawyer. Your ways of language confuse and scare me. 
Does anybody have any sugar cubes? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, Jesus Christ. But Sorry. He, but he writes about this, um, you know, big he, hot Ka- horse. Kafka, um, a lot. Do you trust his narrators? This is also a thing that I, I believe is relatively new uh, um, at the time. Is the unreliable mm-hmm. narrator mm-hmm. Joseph mm-hmm. K? You know, Joseph K is talking about how he's innocent, but but do we know Who's that? Say? What I mean, it, it, the unreliable narrator is a part of the active reading. You know, you it yes. is easy. You have to. You have. It's a thing that we. You, every time you read now, you have to say, "Who's telling me this story? Is Who the can I trust here? Or is is it the person?" Right. It's mm. um. It's a. It's a. It's a. Uh, it's a literary example of Plato's allegory of the cave. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And I, that was a very. That was a very modern literature movement. Mm-hmm. That's a good point, man. That's a very good point. Also in 1917. Can you, can you trust what you're reading? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, can you trust what you're watching? It's part of the experience. Yes. Reader as participant in the narrative. Mm-hmm. And yeah, don't don't tell me too much. I want. I don't want to get into uh, this week's West Westworld. It was. Uh, it <laughs> uh, 1917. He also he attempts to join the army. Of course, the World War One's happening by now. Um, and he attempts to join the army, but he is instead diagnosed with tuberculosis. Uh, <laughs> and in his mind, bohemian. yeah, in his mind, he is now condemned Come to on write. medical leave. <laughs> what? In his mind, he's what? He's condemned to write. The rest ah. of his life is now writing because what eventually um, he leaves the insurance company. They, they put him on a pension uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, from this point on, he never holds an office job because he's paid not to work. Because he has, I mean, yeah, and he has tuberculosis, and which is a disease that they have no way, they do not treat back then. And he's got to move to he, Arizona or something. Yeah, he, he moves he's, to the country is what he does. He spends time in sanatoriums, and he goes out of the country and visits his sister in the farm. And Is he expected to do creative <laughs> writing for a living? I mean, not necessarily. It's just it, 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 that's who he is. He okay. um, he is literature, John. Remember that. But it's not it's not like expected by society at the time. No, 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 no. Yeah, but he's but paid, he is, he's go paid to convalesce. Yes, All right. He he is he is known among writers as a writer to know among, among thinkers, and um, <laughs> he's not necessarily um, famous by any means. But you know, right. um, nineteen seventeen. He also writes a short story called "The Silence of the Sirens." Mm-hmm. And in it, he 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 argues that um, it is it is not the the song of the sirens that makes them dangerous. It is when they are making no noise that makes them dangerous. And ah. he talks about how Odysseus, when Odysseus has the wax in his ears, he is still attracted to the sirens because he assumes through their movements that they are sexual, and he is attracted to that. He doesn't know what sound they're making, but he assumes yeah. that. Through their movement, it is a, it is a sexual act, and he's attracted yeah. to that. That's a pretty deep. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. You like that? That's a pretty deep breakdown because Odysseus has the men on his ship tie him to the mast. Yeah. Right, so he doesn't have the wax in his ears. Right, you're you're right, but his, his the, uh, he may have wax in his ears. I, I, I can't remember, but that may be part of I, his, I, I, I do Q-tip think. era. Yes. What did you just say? I said it's a pre-Q-tip era. <laughs> That's right. It's such a vibrant thing. <laughs> Very. <laughs> On those ships, they had no cotton swabs. Aaron. You have a fuck with swab <laughs> in the poop deck, Joe. <laughs> yeah, he he made his men tie. He wanted to hear the songs, but uh, t- they made he made his men tie. Right. Okay. So in his version, mass. Ulysses yeah. does have the wax in his ears. But yeah, but. Uh, Yes, I concede that he had the wax in his ears as yes. well. But what is so interesting is that it is, uh, to, to coin a phrase that we've said on the show many times, it's the space between the notes. Yes, yes, exactly. It's not, it's not when you're doing the lines that you feel a pull. It's when you're not doing the lines that you think, I should do another line of Coke. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right? Am yeah. I right? Yeah. That's pretty good, I, man. That's pretty good shit, Joe. That's pretty tight shit. Man, that's right really there. good, Kafka. That's really good shit. 
And uh, Kafka opens the Damn. story by, he writes, um, he writes, proof that inadequate, even childish measures may serve to rescue one from peril. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, sometimes you hear stuff that you just realize that you're not smart. <laughs> And that usually happens. Of, but all again, the time this is for me. this is his introduction to a story <laughs> that he wrote that changes Odysseus's story a little bit. It, sure, it, it that's is self-serving fine. as self. Oh, that's fine. But it is it is uh, very clever. It's very good, very clever. Uh, I love much that. much less clever, but interesting. Uh, in 1917, he also has a, a diary entry called "A Life," and it's about life as a dog. Uh, huh. And he, and he writes, he, he describes life thusly. He says, quote, a stinking bitch. <laughs> Bearer of many children already rotting in places, but which everything to me in my childhood, which incessantly follows me faithfully, which I cannot bring myself to strike, and before which, avoiding her breath, I move back step by step, and which, if I don't make a different decision, will force me into the deadly, visible angle of the wall so that she may completely decay on me and with me to the last, does it honor me? The pus and worm-filled flesh of her tongue in my hand. Uh, this is a man going through... Some shit? Yeah. The left, the right, some swirl of insanity and emotion. Yeah, that's the... That's is the, the, is that all for? F- that's the space? drivel. Of, <laughs> that's the drivel of a madman. Who's supremely talented? It's just you know, sometimes crazy. Sometimes police. <laughs> supremely talented people can. Uh, supremely talented people can. Uh, uh, spew out bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. This is and the, the, using it's a bad still place. Bullshit. Like this. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when Charlie Sheen was like, ah, "I drink tiger blood and I can bang out six gram rocks and bang hookers without condoms and I'm fine." You're like, well, you're clearly crazy, but that's hot fire shit. Yeah, the quotes nice. are, are substantial, and thank right. you. Thank you for also... that, but you're crazy. <laughs> but you, I like you. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> you're crazy. Yeah. I guess back then, though, when everybody was like a genius or whatever, you'd be like, I'm going to write down everything they say, and you're like, they're on like a ton of fucking GHB or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but you also imagine, you know, everybody, all correspondence is is physical. Everybody's yeah, keeping a and, diary. You know, yeah, exactly. The correspondence was collated and, and recorded and all that. And also I mean, I not everybody the, had paper and ink. So, like, it, you know, if you were going to commit something down to paper and ink and send it through the post, you know, you, you really wanted it, you meant for it to be uh, regarded as such. Well, well, I mean, sometimes you just threw it away. I think it's passages like that that made Kafka um, on his deathbed ask Max Brode to burn everything. Oh, yeah? yeah? Yes. We've known a few people on this show who are like, <laughs> yes. burn, burn everything I ever wrote. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Nobody ever respects um, the wishes. <laughs> I am mailing this to the yeah. record office. Well, well no one... Well, uh, no one but the Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> they're the only oh, no. people. They got they got all their everything. They did a pretty good job of that. Yeah, actually. well, they they were big into burning before they even took powers. Yeah, so. that's another thing. <laughs> that was uh, Books, sorry, records, I'm sorry, Jews. I'm sorry, Matt. Are you going there for the for the? I mean, ending? we'll get there. We'll get there. Well, but, we were but... while we were discussing while you're having technical difficulties was making this a two parter, uh, for the analysis part of his life. Because right. we're already at two hours. Yeah, so we should yep. get to the end of his life and then. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, then let's just let's, let's hop to it. Um, um, nineteen eighteen. He he gets his pension. Um, he lives. He, he goes to various sanatoriums. Lives in the country for his health. Nineteen nineteen. He writes that one hundred page thing to his father. All my writing was about you. I only lamented there the things I couldn't lament on your breast. Jeez. And his dad was alive. Oh, yeah. God. 1919, he publishes his short story, The Country Doctor, uh, which we'll get into the next one. 
1920, he meets uh, Milena Jesenka, who is his muse of muses. And she is uh, part of, she is the, married to uh, one of the um, authors of, um, I forget his name, but he's famous for that time. Maybe now, I can't remember. Uh, part of this group of, of intellectuals and such. And he meets her and they, they have an affair and a, a very, um, and he, this is his new woman to write letters to of mm-hmm. his madness. and his, Who he was never going to have sex with anyways. Um, and she is a huge fan of. And I'll talk about the next one of some of the things she said about him. She is an absolutely, uh, again, never, never throws away any of their correspondence. Uh, 1922, he writes The Castle, which um, uh, it, he never finishes it. He cites exhaustion from illness. The Castle is a very interesting. Another one, a, a, a man shows up into town. He's a surveyor. And the town says, well, I don't, wait, why are, she, why are you here? And he says, well, I've, I've been told to survey. And they're like, well, you got to go to the castle. And the entire book is him trying to get to the castle. Mm. But the entire time he's stopped by the bureaucracy of normal people and organizations. Dude, what the fuck yeah. is going on with bureaucracy at this time? It, 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 is, it is a structure. It is a, it yeah. like a machine. It is, another, it is one other yes. thing to... It is a machine. Work yes. your way just, through. I don't know, man. I just don't think it's this big threat that everybody makes it out to be. And it's well, it was so a stupid. new thing it's at relative. the time. And it is a threat. Oh, Aaron, it lost. Oh, Aaron, Aaron oh. is lost. Wait, hold on. It's and we're good. back. <laughs> so we were talking about bureaucracy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, okay, uh, 1922, he writes The Castle. Never finishes it. It comes out in 1925, I believe. Uh, 1923, he's 40 years old now. He moves to Berlin to live so with this 19 year old named Dora DeMont. Jesus. Nice. She's yeah. hot? She's cute, but she's 19. <laughs> she's cute. They're probably not even. Uh, maybe they are having sex. I don't know. Uh, but, but, uh, but he moves to Berlin. He moves to Berlin in 1923, and Berlin is um, not a great Poppin. place to be. Oh. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, he's uh, eventually he he's in poverty. There's bread lines. There's just yeah. And she she does write. She's she's like he really likes standing in lines. This guy loves standing in lines all day. This but he maybe, also hates it. Yes, of course. The absurdity. He likes of, writing uh, about it. The bureaucracy of the line or something, right? The humiliation right. of, of mm-hmm. uh, the. It's but, a human centipede of uh, <laughs> bread-like proportions. It's. He, he he says that he writes in this time that in 1923 that he's one of the reasons he moved to Berlin is that he's running from the phantoms that made him write. So he 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 has these moments now he's he's turned on himself almost. Um, the things, yeah, long ago. Well, yeah, yeah but 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 the, he was into the writing, right? He was into the marriage until he wasn't. He was into the writing until now. He was into mm. until uh, um, everything that there's a, a, a the pendulum is swinging among everything in his life. Yeah, um, but he's 23, and the last thing the spirits do to him, or the second to last, is he writes the burrow, in which it's the story of this animal that is um, below ground, and you know, uh, insulated in this its own little tunnel, but it can hear all of the predators through all of the walls. Mm. And it's constantly, it's constantly paranoid, paranoid, and eventually, you know, do they break through? Uh, mm. He asks Dora to burn all of his writings. She does not. 1924, his throat closes up because the tuberculosis has crawled up out of his lungs and into his larynx. Jesus. His throat closes up. He can't have any more solid food. And he's in um, the hospital. He's starving to death. And he's also working on... He maybe he probably appreciated this, even though he would never admit it. The the irony he's working on his uh, one of his last stories called the fasting artist or the hunger oh, artist. Jesus Christ! About this is something he had written before he started writing before this, or he, he wrote before this. Um, was it's about this this um, famous this guy who's famous for fasting, because fasting was a was a thing that was, yeah, that was yeah, big yeah, around sure. those times, and not the li- not the living skeletons, but people who would uh, and this story. For help. The, the, yes, and he was always skeptical of fasting himself, and, and this story kind of comes from that. And it, and he writes about this man who is in a freak show for fasting, 
but the man's handlers will never let him fast for more than 40 days. And so eventually, the man does not make enough money, and so his handlers let him go. And he joins a circus, and the circus doesn't care about him, so he, will fa- he fasts forever until he dies. And Damn. right before he dies, someone goes, well, why are you fasting? And he says, I just never found any food I liked. <laughs> And so after he dies, they put a panther in his cage, and all of these people show up, and they're like, wow, a panther, it's so full of life, this is amazing, and we'll feed it stuff. And it's kind of this, you know... And they feed it the man who has fasted. No, 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 he, they didn't even, there was, right before he died... Oh, they, just they, in his cage, they replaced... Cage. Yes, yes, they replaced him. They didn't even know he was, he was dying. The, before that question was asked to him about why he fasted, people were walking by, and then someone was like... Oh, there's a pile of there's a man in that straw. Damn. Uh, so he but, fasted. He fasted to the point of irrelevance. Yes. 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 Oh. Is, oh, and boy. it was called the fasting artist or the hunger artist. Right. Oh, by, hey, Mark. By, by way of uh, disinterest. Yeah. yeah. And it, you know, there's. Do you a, think there's ever been a more German story ever written? <laughs> <laughs> There is a taste there's an of cuisine thing, entirely though. bland. I thought I'd rather go to my grave, depriving myself. The, the tasting thing you are, the thing you are known for, or the 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 thing that that you you're not you're not allowed to do it to your um, satisfactory uh, amount, and you know eventually when you are, I love to you. fast forever, but unfortunately, the shackles of my own biology have limited my <laughs> artistic talents. <laughs> So there, I'm resigned to eating three or four schnitzels per month. So, uh, I'm a it, slow faster. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1924, uh, he's editing this. He's on his deathbed. He asked that he can only write. He can't talk anymore. His larynx has been destroyed by the tuberculosis. Jesus. He can only write, and he writes his doctor. He asks his doctor for euthanasia. The doctor says no, and he writes to the doctor. He says, "If you don't kill me, you're a murderer." I love that. And then I shortly after that. that, he dies. 1924. He's uh 41 years old. Um, Milena Jens- Jasenka, in his in her obit for him, she writes. He was a man condemned to regard the world with such blinding clarity that he found it unbearable and went to his death. Yes. He has to, he has Brode to, to burn everything. Brode does not. Um, he doesn't. Um, the Brode even he um, he he publishes the Hunger Artist in the Castle uh, posthumously. Um, I believe uh, the trial too. The, well, the trial, yes, the trial Brode had to put together because Kafka. Wrote he in, he was in such a frenzy, and he also knew that he he was late. He 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 was he was um, he he would put these things off. He wrote the first chapter and the last chapter first immediately. <laughs> he wrote those two, and then nice. he spent the rest of the time filling it in. But he took the folder, he put it in folders, and he didn't number them, and so, so there was smart. no order to it. And so right. Broad had to had Figure to, and, and so there so whatever order it is in, is not the right order, or it is it doesn't. It is what it is. Um, Let me ask both of you: What do you think about that? The, the lack of, um, you know, kind of falling in with the wishes from somebody like Max Brode, who's the, the close friend that has. Well, I, I would have to imagine that somebody like Kafka knew that they wouldn't follow his wishes, anyways. Yeah, but yeah, if I mean, those yeah. are your explicit wishes, do you not? Uh, yeah, well, you got to read between the lines of some people's wishes sometimes. I mean, for a guy like Kafka, he, 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 that's interesting, maybe, Aaron. Maybe, maybe one day he's like, "This is great," and the next day he says, "Burn it all." I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you do? I think Road right, was Road was his but, best friend for over is, half his life. I think he, but, I think he had an idea. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's still. It's a little tough. It's it is. Tough it me. is. It is selfish. It's selfish for all of us. Yeah, and of you know, you saw Knives Out. You know how <laughs> tricky wills are. No, but you know what I'm saying. Like, yes, of you, we, I, I do think just about that. Like, yes. You're like, listen, I just want to be remembered for the metamorphosis and my published works, and 
these other things, like whatever. And then like you can't. You... But, but 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 the thing is, he wouldn't have been. He wouldn't have been remembered at all when his without, books are translated. The... His books are when his books are translated into English in the 1930s. Then he gets international recognition. And and then as Robertson writes that this is the the Anglo-American phenomenon catches up with him. W. H. Auden, 1941, writes uh, had to, had to name one artist who comes nearest to bearing the same kind of relation to our age that Dante, Shakespeare, and Goethe bears to them. Kafka is the first one I would think of, without Good. that being translated Good. into Good. English. Jesus, he does not he does not become the Kafka we know. Mm-hmm. And so, Unless he's translated into English, mm-hmm. which is the result of keeping all those manuscripts or, or those unpublished works around. Yeah. Aaron, I would say you might be more knowledgeable about this sort of thing than I would, but would you say that you think Kafka is kind of like the one that's like between the Kierkegaard and the, the science fiction, like Matheson mm. type huh. thing? Isn't he kind of like he, right he, on the precipice his, of that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it, I don't know if Kierkegaard Kierkegaard is the right bookend, but it is kind of a, it is um, philosophical speculative fiction, right? It's not so sci-fi as it is absurdism, and mm-hmm. uh, so. I don't know. I don't know if the bookends that you've supplied are the are, are the right ones. I don't know if they're the wrong ones, but I do think he does toe that line in between philosophy and fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like a crazy thing as a way of an, like exposing a point, I think is kind of well, like, yeah. And he, ser- he certainly had a theme, right, or yeah. or a, a pattern, right, Matt? Like he did have this kind of ongoing theme of a rejection of an obsession mm-hmm. with. Bureaucracy. It's so fascinating. That's that. Well, it's that all, it was also a new thing at the time because monarchies were falling all over the globe, yeah. and they were being replaced by republics and quote unquote democracies. And and when you have those things coming uh, into their own, there's downsides to those as well, right? The benefit to a monarchy or a benef- uh, or an authoritarian regime is that it's what one man says goes. Mm-hmm. And the downside to a democracy is that it's the best form of government or it's the worst form of government except all others. Right. Right. So it's the, you know, there's a lot of bullshit you have to deal with. So when one of these new things comes about, you're, you're going to have, um, bones to pick with it. And I think that was the kind of time that the man found himself in. Um, what was it that brought the, the story to you, Matt? Um, I, well, I read, um, years ago I read Metaphor- Metamorphosis, and then a couple years ago I read The Trial, and it just, it, it's one of those... Um, trial is one of the ones that was supposed to be burned. Uh, I think so. I, By I, I Max can't... Broad. Yeah, no, I, I did I did read that. That, okay. was, that was one of the things that was supposed to be destroyed. It, I mean, it, there's, there's it's, a, it's a story that is... Um, I find I found it laughable. I found it hilarious in in some ways because it's so good. It's, it's, it's so absurd. Good. Yes, it's fr- frustrating because mm. you know as even as the reader you are are stymied, and much like Joseph K is. You 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 are yeah, shot out of. Well, you, you are in this fucking thing. And then there's these reading re- it. in each of these, especially with in this one in the trial, there are these moments of 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 sexuality and. Um, if you didn't know better, you would think they were having sex, um, and 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 there is eroticism to mm. the, this this these weird small little moments, and then there there is frustration, and so there's all of these things that you can you recognize in your own life these moments of wait why did the cop do this wait why is this an attra- why am I attracted to this person in this moment all of this is weird and there's no real right answer for it, and it's all absurd and stupid and 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 in reading it i there's no way i came from those going there's something about this guy there's something mm-hmm. about him that yeah. that is in this that is as deeply confusing to him as it is to me hmm. Hmm. um and it was just a, it was a very um just exciting i i was at this i was in san diego at this like a uh, 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 fucking comic book store in the middle of one of those like 
uh, business parks where it's just everybody pulls up their 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 uh, garage door at the beginning of the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's where I found this Kafka Arkram hmm. David Zane Merowitz book. And reading that, it was like, oh yeah, Kafka. He was a manic. He was, he was a goof. But it yeah. you know, finally gave me perspective into the guy who uh, Kafka esque is 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 not scary. It's only scary. That's a that's a personal. That's a mm. personal projection. Scary. Yeah. Absurd doesn't. For me, absurd is funny. But for some people, absurd is scary. Mm. And I understand that. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of stuff is yeah. people also putting their their fears out on the page too. So. Yeah. It's uh. It's not as if he. I mean, uh, he apparently had a um, overwhelming, uh, terrifying fear of mice. Oh, that's interesting. About that never Kafka. that 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 uh, never came up. I mean, one thing that came up a lot was in the translation of the 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 metamorphosis, is that some translations called it an insect, but the yeah. the, trans, the original phrasing is vermin. I was going to say vermin. Shit. No shit. Yeah, be, because it's 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 not an insect has this this idea of the vermin is a thing that is just unwelcome, no matter yeah, what. Yeah, vermin is. can be an insect yeah, or was, a rat. One of the the random things I heard about Kafka was that he had a um, terrifying, I mean, just absolutely horrifying fear of mice. No, that's funny. Um, and that now Orwell had a fear of rats. Right from the Spanish Civil War, that's running right. over his legs in the, yeah. in the in trenches. The trenches. Yeah. Um, well, maybe if we all want to be good writers, we should get a crippling fear of some kind of vermin. I suppose, be it possible. Well, or, or a <laughs> raccoon. Uh, or even one a, with uh, thumbs? Lice. <laughs> Earwigs. So, Matt, next time, do you want to... I mean, are you... Do you we'll have... do a deep dive into the... Um, more into this philosophy of this uh, character that you've... Uh, Ka- Kafka? Kafka? Cat Williams, Frank. Cat Williams. Cat Williams. Frank. Do you have Do you have a, a wrap up that you want to dish before we? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, there, there's 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 two little things. Uh, one is uh, Robertson uh, writes that uh, uh, that Kafka is is uh, classic. He's a, the versatility of his work confirms its greatness. For a classic work is precisely one that can be viewed afresh from every new angle. Hmm. And there is, mm-hmm. a, you know, there's a th- applicable things. Uh, one thing, but my uh, Kafka, um, he does, he, he is religious in some ways, um, but he's constantly trying to figure it out. And there's just this one passage he wrote. Um, he says, suffering is the only positive element in this world. Indeed, it is the only link between this world and the positive. Only here is suffering, suffering. Not as thought those who suffer here are elsewhere to be elevated because of this suffering, but what is in this world is called suffering. In another world, unchanged and merely free from its opposite is bliss. And hmm. this is, so he's got this weird Buddhist element to his uh, life is suffering, and, and what connects us to you know as as when he was younger, learning about uh, Hasidism and the gods are approachable. Jesus is suffering. We are suffering. People on Earth are suffering. Mm. Is that not a connection to? The, the, right. It's not, it's it's not some the, Christian, um, unknowable, insane heaven somewhere. Maybe it's here. This kind right, of it, and it seems to be a, a theme in his work of uh, the definition of its thing by its opposite. Mm-hmm. By pointing out suffering, I'm illuminating you to bliss. Yes. Or you experiencing pointing... suffering is illuminating you to bliss. Right, right. Because be, that that um, that's fucking interesting, man. And there's something I was reading earlier. Uh, I don't know what it was. Uh, God, it must have been. I must have been listening to something on YouTube. Well, it does tie into your theory you've been repeating about the best times we had was during the Blitz of London. The Blitz of London. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Of... I think it's some. I think I definitely think it's related to that. Um, in the, the in sometimes you know the worst of times are the best of times, but sometimes you don't. And I, I, maybe this is too reductionist, but you don't appreciate the dark without the light, or you don't appreciate sure. the light without the dark. But for sure, there. I I, be, I would think I was reading something. 
in the past few weeks during this whole quarantine thing that was very much in line with the using the opposite of one thing to illuminate it by by just you know using absurd what's the opposite of absurdity order Mm -hmm. right so so kafka is is using bureaucracy the order to highlight absurdity or to use absurdity to highlight bureaucracy is is the order not absurd the order is absurd absolutely (sighs) yes perfect exactly yeah, so sure. it's, it's, it does seem to be a theme of his work. Um, and that's, that's um, I think that's the stroke of a true artist, right? It's not the notes that you play. It's the notes that you don't play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the space between the words. That's mm-hmm. And now you're very, very good, you, Matt. The reader is filling that in. Exactly. That's really, really good stuff, Matt. I like that a lot. I really do. I can't wait for the second part of this episode. We're going to get a little more deep into this, is, uh, I presume. Yes, absolutely. Very exciting time. John, what do you think? I think it's going to be a a, a grand old deep discussion. Oh. You know? I love it when it's deep and old. Oh, God. (laughs) If you'd like to find out more about the weird, bizarre ideas of this friend's Kafka character, (laughs) check us out over on the Patreon. Extra episode a week. Five bucks a month. Don't even worry about it. You're getting Just that fuck. stimulus check. Yeah. <laughs> Subscribe. Come on, we're going to talk about it. We're going to get into the real shit. Don't be weird. It's all right. Right? Ooh, you boy. down with that, Matt? Yeah. That sound nice? Is yeah. that something you might be interested in, Joe? <laughs> now, does that sound like something you might be interested in? What, that Nazi sled? Get real. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's do a... a to be continued right now, and I'm going to say goodnight. My name is John Fahey. My name is Aaron Pita. I also say goodnight. I presume. Good night, everybody. We love you. Starbucks Avenue.